Hey, first of all, thanks a lot for coming on here, man. I appreciate it. Um, we've been trying to set this up for a little bit, and I'm glad we got it. We got it worked out. Uh, the yeah. one thing I wanted to say before uh, we get started is uh, you probably don't remember this, but it was like I want to say it was around '96. We were at a competition awards banquet, and uh, I, I went to the back. You know how we used to tuck our berets and our belts. Uh, oh, yeah. and then, uh, yeah. Do you remember this? I don't know if you remember, but I went to the bathroom and I came out of the bathroom and you had gone in there right after me and you picked up my beret. I had dropped my beret in the bathroom and uh, that's yeah. like, that's one, one of the cardinal sins of having a beret oh, yeah. is like, you know, dry, you get losing your beret. You know, you yeah. could have like, you know, you could have called me out. You could have froze it. You could have done a myriad of other things, but you were super cool about it. And you just walked up behind me. And you're like, Hey man, cause you were a little bit older than I was. And I was like, I was like an A1C. You know, wet behind the ears for sure. And you just handed it to me like, hey, be careful next time or something like that. It, you were super cool. And that yeah. always kind of like stuck with me. It, it, it kind of defined you like you're, you know, you're like the super badass tech P dude. But then you're also like a like a good guy. You know, you're like you looked out for me instead of like crushing me, which I always appreciated that. So I always uh, look to you and you at that light. Well, I appreciate that. It, it was always important to me. And I'll hit on it when I got to the schoolhouse in a little bit. It was always important to me to, to the people that I worked alongside, the people I supervised, the people I worked for. I wanted people to know that I care. I, I, I truly wanted the best for me. Yeah. I, I saw, I got to the 14th. This is 92 when I cross trained. I got to the 14th when, you know, we really had a mindset where if you weren't from Bragg, you, were, you weren't even a real tag B. You know, we right. were ruthless, yeah. and young airmen being naive fed that. That's what, just what we thought. So, that, so I'd seen so many guys come to the 14th and just get crushed, man. You know the cherries, and just just crushing yeah. the cherries, beating the hell out of them. And I and I was a cross trainee, so I got my fair share. I mean, I, they they took their shots at me when they could could you know had the opportunity. Mikey Brown and I, I thought for sure that dude hated me, and and uh, not until very recently that I told him, I said, dude, he goes, why, what's, what's up with us? I was like, dude, you don't even like me. Why do you even, he's like, what are you talking about? I always looked up to you. I was always intimidated by you. I was like, what are you talking about? And uh, so anyway, I, I had some, some growing pains coming as a cross training. So when I saw guys come in, we made them wear the wings and run around and, and cherry helmets and just treat them like dog. I just, I wasn't completely on board with it. I thought, look, dude, we have, and you'd have young guys that were starving for information, starving for, to be ETACs, and guys would just close hold all their, their knowledge, and I just didn't want to do that. I mean, like if, if yeah. I, the, my mindset was, if I had information to help someone think of how to control cast in a different way, or help them get through a problem, solve a problem, or set them up with some information to make them better for the future. And if I was going to keep that information close hold, I was failing them. I was failing right. them as a supervisor. I was failing them as a peer. So I just took it to heart, man. I wanted dudes to not worry about all the little stuff because we're all young men and we're all mouth breathers and we're all going to screw up. Just give us, give us, give us a chance, dude. We're, we're, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be dudes. And right. uh, but I thought about the times when you can really take an opportunity to, to make an impact on a dude. And uh, I've had I've had a couple really good friends tell me something similar to that in the, in the, in the, in the past, and it, it's meant a lot to me that at least I was a good person. So Yeah, for yeah. sure. That's what, I, that's what I took away. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so do you want to start from the beginning? Uh, tell us how you got in the military. And then yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious to see... Because you said you went to Desert Storm, uh, but as a, an aircraft mechanic, so I'm curious to hear how that went. Like I know how yeah. some other guys like Kenny Lindsay and you know Paul Ford and all those guys went to uh, as Tag P's, but right. I'd like to hear the other side. Like so, yeah, feel free. Let's let's see. And let's hear the story. I showed up and I showed up to brag right after all those studs have come back from that, and they they you know they've done some amazing things. You know, yeah. hear Chief Lindsay talk about living in a vehicle for you know months. I mean, these guys. They had tough man, really right. some, badass, some badasses out there. So yeah, I, I, I grew up in the military. Um, uh, my dad was military. He was a medic in the Air Force. Um, so all I knew from the get go was, man, hey, you know, I gotta, I gotta take care of my room. I, I was very disciplined. I, I played sports. I wanted to be like my dad. 
Uh, my dad had gone to Vietnam, and I didn't know this at the time, but he had had very close PJ friends, pararescue guys. And at the time, the medical portion of pararescue, the pipeline was taught at Shepherd. And my dad, being a medic, was trying to cross train and get into pararescue, but he was one of the instructors that would teach PJs along with okay. medics. And cool. so he taught alongside a bunch of PJ instructors as well, AETC instructors as well. So I grew up knowing this Uncle Larry, Uncle Larry, Uncle Larry. He ended up being, you know, he was the chief, he was the commandant at Kirtland, that the okay. last phase of the pipe of the pipeline. I knew him as Uncle Larry. Um, I would I got married to my high school sweetheart and uh, followed her down to Denton, Texas. She went to college and I pushed beer for coors and um struggled you know as young couples do and uh she went on her own way she she left me and stuff and i wanted to go in the military because i wanted to go right out of high school but i fell in love followed chasing girls <laughs> and um my dad and uncle larry came to my uh, townhouse my little apartment in denton texas and uncle larry was like lee got a plan your dad and i talked about it you're gonna join the military you're gonna go in as a medic you're going to volunteer to be a pararescue man and you're gonna you're not gonna have to worry about women ever again i'm like oh, okay <laughs> sounds like a plan dude sign me up right so i had the the, the medic job and i went to a, a basic and you know x whatever week number it is they came in young airmen with blue ascots and pickle suits and their blouse boots and every now and then as an instructor is talking he is pointing to the the ground they just drop start doing push-ups and we're like what the heck is going on so i volunteered i said Shh, I, I know i'm going to do this and uh, i started we were the very first class in 88 that combat control started the, the, with the pipeline so okay. it's now pararescue and uh cct in the pipeline sergeant jeffries jayquees sergeant inch sergeant rodman um Kohovic, was a combat control guy, uh, just just a great group of, of cadre. And, you know, when I washed out, I washed out a week before graduation. They had me in underwaters with the, the 2080 tanks and stuff and doing the crossovers. And, I mean, they just beat the hell out of me. And I was all, I was 24 when I came in. And I knew where the oxygen was. And I knew if I come up before the wall, I could breathe. So I would come up before the wall. Then I'd take a breath and I'd go back down. And by the time I got to the wall, you know, we had 15 seconds on each side to catch our breath. And then we'd go cross over again and do the same thing. Yeah. Well, you eventually go into oxygen debt. But here's this, you know, small bus Lee Blackwell taking quick, quick air shots before you get to the wall. I'm behind the power curve. And I'm, mm -hmm. by the time I crack my mask and start breathing, we got five seconds left. And then, you know, I'm just killing myself so they get tired of me whining about stuff and um they send me the shallow in with this other kid that's down there and i'm thinking i made it i don't worry about those it was eval day and um mm. they they brought me back down there and usually there's six lanes in the pool that they would that we would swim at and they still swim there and uh they you the instructors you ride you in the middle two lanes and they wouldn't mess with you until you know the outer two lanes but once you got to that third lane third fifth and you know third and fifth lane or third and fourth lane whatever they were gonna like sharks man just they punch in the stomach take your fins off smack you in the mask crack your mask punch you in the gut and just beat the heck out of me so when i went to the shallow end to wait my turn i didn't realize i just screwed myself and i went back down there and from wall to wall they rode me man they were yeah. they were beating me up pretty good, and and you, I could literally see things going to blackout, and I was like, mm. I know if I can get to the blackout, they're gonna pull me out because I went to my limit, and they're, I'll be done for the day. Yeah, and uh, I just kept coming up, give myself just enough oxygen, just enough oxygen, and it was just, I was suffering pretty good. At one point, they made the mistake of letting me come up by the ladder. You know, I'm 24 been eight eight weeks in basic which is not much at all but then you do your pararescue training and i've been training for it for months 
and I was lean, dude. I was hard. Yeah. And uh, they couldn't get me off that ladder. And then one of the instructors started choking me. He had me, I'm facing the ladder, and he's got his hands around me, and he's got his foot on the wall, and he's pulling back, back by my neck. He's, my eyes are bugging out. <laughs> and I don't remember when. I remember at some point, I elbowed the dude behind me in the face. Yeah. And then I just remember being spun around, and he stuck his mask to my mask, and he said, I will kill you. And I was just like, ah! <laughs> Lost, and I don't know. Remember when I said the words? I don't know. I don't know it, it, what volume. I have no recollection. And I just remember at one point. So apparently, I said the words. I quit. And yeah. apparently, everybody, everybody got really calm. And I had, there was this one staff sergeant inch. He was like five four by five four. He wanted to be a WWF wrestler. This dude was massively big. Right. And every when we got down to very few instructors, we all had personal instructors, and I had to show up at five o'clock with inch in the weight room before the duty day started and work out with him before we would get smoked by him, you know, Jeez. the hour later. And then we'd go to the pool in the afternoon or vice versa. But anyway, so I washed out of that and they made uh certain Tanner who was the commandant made me, he cross trained me and I got in jet engine mechanic and went to Chanute air force base, Illinois. And I mean, I was probably the, the, the most in shape per person in that entire state. Right. And I was a bunch of Air Force people, you know, regular Air Force people. And I did that yeah. engine mechanic school, and it was it was super easy. And I got to the day of the assignments, and I remember this one kid who was in the corner. He was crying. I was just like, what is your deal, dude? Because I remember a basic training kid's crying. I was just like, this is like camp, dude. Of all the militaries, we have the easiest one. Right. If you think right. you're doing something wrong – you're probably doing something wrong. And if you're not, you're still going to get yelled at, dude. This yeah, is yeah. not this is not stressful, dude. Relax. <laughs> so this kid is in the corner crying. I'm just like, what's up? He goes, I'm going to Japan. I'm like, what? He says, I'm going to Misawa, Japan. I'm like, that's cool, man. He goes, where are you going? I said, Davis Moffat. He goes, I'm from Tucson. I'm like, you want to swap? And he's just like, what? Are you kidding me? I was like, in a heartbeat, dude. He goes, you would go to Japan? I said, I'd go further away if I could. I just want to go see the world, man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got Japan. People are like, it's not hell, but you can see it from there. And while I was there with the Philippines four times, Alaska, Australia, I went on every TV way I could go on. I eventually got stationed in Shaw Force Base, was on the demo team, um, Viper East demo team, and then went to Desert Storm with those guys, Abu Dhabi. And when I was in Abu Dhabi, that's when I hit my cross train window. So I told my supervisor one day, because I worked phase doc. I wasn't on the flight line hanging bombs and, you know, helping them hang bombs and pre-flight and work on engines on the flight line. Every X amount of hours, the planes would come back to us and we'd, you know, I'd do a bore scope and check the, the blades in the engine. They'd get to oh, okay. normal phase inspections. Yeah. So that's where I worked. So one day I was like, hey, you know, in just 12 hours a day. Anytime we bombed something significant, it's like they fed a steak and lobster. Come to find out that was a normal every Friday, you know. Oh. <laughs> Who knew? You're right. That was, that was even in Desert Storm they did that. But um, So I went to this big old tent, and uh, this girl, old, he was walking around with a gas mask on. I had ditched my gas mask months ago and uh, weeks ago, and uh, I said, hey, I'm, I'm putting in – I'm trying to – find out about cross train you know like you know we're in the middle of desert storm i was like yeah i realize that but i don't know how long we're gonna be here and, yeah. you know, i don't want to lose my chance right. i don't want to i liked the flight line i was good at the flight line but i didn't want to be on the flight line for 20 plus years yeah i didn't want to work in you know in that capacity i want to do something different and um so she gave me this big printout, and on the printout was all FSC numbers and how many openings. That's all it said. It didn't say, like, Tackler Command Control Specialist 275, 14 openings. It just said 275, 14 openings. So I knew what medic was. Unfortunately, I knew what cop was, but I did not put it down. I knew what a radio, I knew the AFSC for radiology, and then I saw 275, and it was 14 openings. It had the most openings of all the, the, the AFSCs. So I put it down. I went back to work, did my thing, and 
Um, Desert Storms ends on my birthday, February 28th. I'm actually February 29th, but I'm a leap year baby, so that year we oh, didn't okay. have it. So I had my birthday. Desert Storm ended on my birthday. Weeks later, about a month or so later, we headed back, and I got back to the uh, Shaw, and first started was like, Black, what, did you put in for cross training? I was like, yeah, I did. He goes, well, you got it. I was like, well, what'd I get? I think I'm going to do something medical. Because I figure if, because I remember I was in Japan, and they are talking about downsizing, and they were going to get rid of first-term airmen, obviously, X amount of them. Not understanding the critical career fields and how, how that played a part and whatnot, but I knew that, you know, I wanted my, waited my whole life to get in the military, and they're going to kick me out. I was pissed. Yeah. So I want to do something different. And he goes, well, you got it. I, mean, I said, what did I get? He said, attached to a command control specialist. I was like, what is that? He goes, you don't know what it is? I'm like, no. <laughs> there was nothing. There was not even a job description on it. He goes, holy shit, dude. And back then, you would call MPF. We called it CBPO. And that's where finance was. And they actually gave you out the $100 bills. They paid you for your TDYs and cash back in the day. Well, I had to go to CBP CBPO. And I went to the the people with in charge of cross training, they said, "Yeah, you're, here's the description." Started reading about radios and airborne and working with the army. I was like, "This sounds pretty freaking cool." So I always tell people, "It was my density to become a TAC P because I had no idea what I was signing up for, none whatsoever." Right, right. There was nobody at basic that came and talked to us about TAC P, pararescue, combat control. Yes, not a TAC P guy. I didn't know about it before I came to the military, and. Uh, and once I got to the schoolhouse in 92, I was Falcon 3-2. Falcon 3-2? I think that's what it is. And um, I had staff sergeant guard guy as a class leader. He didn't last a couple of days. They fired him. They made me the class leader. And nice. I had the, the two flights behind me. The class leaders were both chiefs. We had a cross-training chiefs in the class. Really? Class. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so here I was, the senior class, senior airman, trying to mentor these two, two chiefs. Basically, they just had a, a staff or a tech that did all the duties, and they were just the class leader. But um, right, it right. went really well. Tech school was really, really a lot of fun. I remember my first night on the FTX, our first FTX. They we had this. Uh, we were doing night nav. Or vehicle night vehicle nabbing. We didn't have enough dudes, uh, enough instructors for all the vehicles. So the last vehicle they put me in the last vehicle and they said, "Okay, you understand the brake lights and all that MVGs and non MVG driving." It's like, "Yes, yes, sir, I do." It was your job is every time we stop this convoy stops, you change out. You're going to be the last person that drives. Do you understand me? Yes. No one falls asleep, and you stay. Uh, with the convoy, Roger that. So we take off, and it's like a, a hurricane is coming through the the Panhandle of Florida, and um, it's like raining sideways. It's just trees are, you know, think you're going to snap and stuff. Yeah. Convoy stops, change out drivers. We keep going. Convoy stops, change out drivers, and we're getting tired. The heaters on. And at one point, I, I'm, my head is completely back, and I'm asleep. <laughs> and I roll my head over, and I look at the driver, <laughs> and the airman is asleep driving. Oh, no. <laughs> and what has woken me up is the bushes and the trees coming alongside the vehicles, scratching the vehicle. <laughs> so finally, I look, and I kind of roll, nonchalantly roll my head up, and I'm like, looking. And there's nothing. There's no vehicles. There's no nothing. I'm like, what the fuck? So they go. So I slap him. We start hauling ass. And um, I think we see something. I'm going to slow down, slow down, slow down. And it's all of a sudden like red, 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 four red lights. And we'd stop right behind it. And they were actually changing out drivers. And I said, all right, dude, you're done. My turn to drive. And they never knew that we. Oh, so, man. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, that's dude. awesome it was such a <laughs> and we so that was just the the vehicle nav uh night nav portion i remember their first day solo nav um gosh 
I wonder. I hope I hope I remember their instructor. I have horrible memory. I have yeah, horrible. Same. Um, I'm at my nap point. I call in. You know, so and so. I'm at my point. It's okay. Rain, get in the tree line. Remain tactical. Hydrate. Monitor the radio. Class leader. Okay. I get in the get in the tree line. I build a fighting position. I've got palmetto bushes all fucking lined up, dude. I'm just, <laughs> no one's gonna see me. All right. I hear the vehicle come in, pulls up, calls my name. <laughs> Remain tactical and silent. He gets on the radio. I can hear him calling. There's nobody here. I'm like, what? Pop my head up above the palmettos. I'm like, gets the vehicle. He drives off. I'm like, oh, <laughs> get back on the radio. I said, uh, structure just left. He goes, he said he was calling you. He said you weren't there. I was like, I'm right here. He goes. Instructors request you stand in the in the road in the front lane rest position. I'm like, okay, great. Oh. So he comes up and he's like, got the vehicle up against my head. He's trying, you weren't here. You're a liar. I'm like, I was right over there. You almost stepped on me. I'm like, there's no freaking way. I said, all right, stand right, stand right here. And I walked over there and I laid down. I said, come and find me. And he goes, holy shit, dude. Nice <laughs> job getting the vehicle. Because he told me I was a no go. I didn't want to have to do it again. Oh hell no. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I made it through the tech school. I uh got Commandant's Award, Spirit of Corps Award, got the only airborne slot, went to Bragg. I was married and my wife was stationed at uh Pope. She was okay. uh family advocacy before she got her commission. And um so I had to get airborne. I needed to get airborne and it just worked out that way. I went to airborne school and Again, cross trainee. I show up the Friday before. I am totally ready. I check into billeting, and the woman is standing there. She's looking at my orders. She says, You're here to start jump school. I said, Yes, ma'am, I am. There's my orders. Hmm. Okay, well, you need to be at Charlie Company over at the square you know, near jump school. I said, Ah, uh, that's Monday. It says it starts on this date. I'm three days early. She goes, Okay, sure. So I get a room in billeting. I walk around all weekend. I'm like walking around the 250 foot towers, walk around the PT fields. I'm like, oh yeah, going to be airborne. All <laughs> right. So I show up four o'clock, Charlie Company, and people are running around just absolutely with their heads cut off, yelling, screaming. I walk in, Senior Emily Blackwell, cross trainee, <laughs> Air Force guy. And I'm like, ha, ha, ha trying to get somebody to slow down and I finally see this sergeant he's got a black hat on you know this guy's staff sergeant rank I said staff sergeant he goes it's sergeant airborne beat your face <laughs> okay so now I'm doing push ups I know how to do those I recover myself I'm standing there and I finally try to flag somebody else down and, he, and the guy says what do you want stupid I said I'm here for jump school uh, starts today and everybody's just no one's helped me out and he goes well why don't you go stand in that line over there I'm like, okay, cool. So I go stand in the line. I'm standing in this line. There's like six guys in front of me. And we're at the first sergeant's office. And I'm like, I think I'm in the wrong line. I don't think I'm supposed to be in this line. I'm here for jump school. I'm not here for an ass Right. Because there's a lot of yelling coming from the office. And the, <laughs> the door would open up and a dude would leave the building. And then the guy would shuffle forward. And then this people come shuffling away from me. I'm like, I'm not going in there. There's, there's no way. So finally, there's like three of us left. First sergeant sticks his head out and looks out. He goes, how many dumbasses are still out there? He says, all you, all you dumbasses come in. So we all go in there, and they're all like position of attention, kind of modified parade rest, and they all hand orders. And he, what's your excuse, Air Force? And I kind of flick my orders across his desk. I'm like, I'm here for jump school. Been here since Friday. Well, where you been there, Air Force? I've been in the building, checked in on Friday. Well, as it says right here in your order, so he's choose my ass. He goes, I tell you what, smart guy. He says, You got about ten minutes to get to the other building to fill out all the paperwork and go to the parade grounds where you're gonna talk to the command sergeant major and then jump school starts. He goes, If you can get all your paperwork done, you'll start jump school. If not, you're gonna be painting rocks with me next week. And I'm like, Oh crap. Oh, man. So we get over there. People are helping me fill out stuff. And I'm done. And they say, okay, you're going to be across this field 
right over there, those bleachers, that's where you're going. So I start running. Getting pretty close, and I see this guy's guy's back to me. Big dude. I walk up, tap him on the shoulder, turns around, it's command sergeant major. He's got his belt on. Yeah. <laughs> he's looking at the shoulder like I put a virus on him or something. And he, <laughs> he's like he's just taking a bite of a lemon. He starts spitting in my face as he's yelling at me. Don't you ever put your hands on me. Who the FR, what the Air Force just loses it like a smoky sandwich. Right. He's pissed. And now he's spitting on the back of my head as I'm sitting in front of me in the rest position. And uh, I'm like, God, I just wanted to go to jump school. That's all I wanted to do. <laughs> so he recovers me and I stand up. And he goes, what's your name? I said, see, you're in your black wall. He goes, see those men over there? And he points to all the black hats standing behind the bleachers. He says, that's where you need to be. And I said, oh, they don't look too happy. I don't know if I want to go over there. He goes, oh, you want to stay with me? And he puts his arm around me. He goes, I tell you what, why don't you spend the day with me? And then we'll see if you, you even start jump school. I say, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> so I go over there, and I'm standing there, and I'm just looking, and there's like 20 of them or so. And I'm just looking at them, and they're all like, say something, I dare you, say something. I said, can someone please help me start jump school? And they all start laughing. And then some guys like in the front is like, "What's your name? What's your last four? I said, "Black one six seven nine zero." This guy in the back, damn it! You belong with me, stupid. Come over here. What did you touch the sergeant major? I said, like, "I didn't. I didn't." So that was my day one of jump school. Nice. So in my yeah, just in in jump school was so it just hurry up and wait. It was yeah. so painful, you know, doing all the PLFs and shuffling, running, slowing down, running, slowing down. Yeah, what a yeah. painful school. And to get under canopy and to think, and I think they still do this. There's just a dude on the on the ground with a bullhorn when someone has a malfunction. You need to pull, you know, execute your, you know, your reserve. You have a major malfunction. And you see right. like four or five of them start coming out. It's <laughs> like, what? I don't get it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I was the first jumper in the door, my very first jump. That was amazing. I had, uh, remember, we back in the day, we stood in the door. That, uh, that load master opened that door, cleared the door, or handed, gave the door to the jump master. I was like, looking at the door, I was like, holy shit, this is going to happen. This is about to happen. Yeah. <laughs> my dad, like when I was, where I was born, my dad was stationed in Torrejon, uh, Spain, and he skydived on, on, on base. It's the jump okay. And they would do little air shows and stuff and perform for air shows and stuff so i was like oh i'm gonna get to i'm gonna be airborne like my dad because i lost my dad in 95 to a massive heart mm -hmm. attack so i've been without him for a long time yeah, so that man yeah he's just such a good dude man it would be really cool to have my dad around it would be uh it would be amazing it really would be yeah. and I've, I've missed out on a lot and uh being the only son and you know i wish i could I, my dad would have been around but anyway so i you know go to jump school have a blast and uh we are i don't know what jump we're on but it must have been the third or fourth that we started jumping combat equipment mm -hmm. the two by fours in the 1950 weapon case all right and of course they didn't back then they didn't rig them to lower them but you just disconnected and kind of pushed it out of the way to do your mm -hmm. plf and uh, I remember somebody had gotten hurt. I had heard somebody got hurt. And I didn't realize what had happened until chow that night. We had a Marine, uh, a Navy guy, Corman, that when he did his POF, the two by four had come up and hit him right in the top, right below oh. his nose and right in his mouth. Broke all Man. his teeth. But his oh. lip, his lip must have been out to here, dude. He was trying to eat his peas. He was trying to eat his peas off of the spoon. And his lip kept hit, touching the spoon. He had tears coming out of his eyes. Oh. I cannot. It was so funny. But his whole face was black and blue. Oh, my God. He busted his ass bad, dude. But that was something I remember about jump school. So then, I, you know, I, I make it to jump school. I'm a five-jump chump. Get to brag. I walk up to brag, and the 
first person, there's a guy sitting outside on the picnic table, is Shane Dunn. A lot of guys brag no Shane. They, his call sign was me. They call me. Apparently, yeah. he take it out quite often, apparently. <laughs> and uh, so I walk up and meet him, and, and I really can't share the conversation on this platform. Right. It's not very sanitized, but right. it was, it, I got to meet him first. And I walked into the 14th ASOS. The very next person who's walking up to me is Brian Daly. And as I walk up to him, I'm putting my hand out to shake his hand. I say, hey, Lee Blackwell. He charges me, wraps me up, arms around, pinned to my side, picks me up, and slams me to um, to the ground into the, <laughs> the, the vehicle bay of yeah. the 14 ASOS. And now, at one point, I'm looking at a hand. I don't know if it's my hand or his hand. I don't know if it's the right or the left. He's got me all twisted up. And I'm just like trying to catch my breath. I'm like, dude, what the hell? Is you a wrestler? I was like, no, I didn't wrestle in school. My high school didn't have wrestling. He goes, oh, you're stocky, man. You feel like a wrestler. I figured you'd be a good wrestler. I was like, no, get off me. <laughs> like, all right, man, anyway, welcome to the 14th. I was like, I, had, I said, find Bravo Flight. And I, I worked uh, alongside Mikey Brown, Sean Minion, uh, Robert Mathis, uh, Andy Kubik, Larry Patton, just some amazing, amazing. Chris Griffin, he was in our flight. Yeah, it's a solid crew, man. That's we just had great. Just stacked, man, stacked. Steve yeah. Fields was there. Um, Kenny Lindsay, you just got back from Ranger School not long before. We had Manny Munoz. We had um, McKenzie. This is guy, redhead guy, McKenzie, Mac McKenzie. Uh, he went to the AC-130 gunship, I think, as he crossed her. Oh, okay. But he, just big dudes. Uh, Roger. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just Kleber was there. Kenny Watterson. Yeah, it was yeah. just stacked. 14 day yeah. sauce. And it was, uh, it was definitely a life experience to be stationed at the 14th right. and be attacked P there. It was completely different from being on the flight line. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> you can imagine. <laughs> I figured that, hey, I was a senior airman. If there were schools, I outranked people. There was that, that was not, I got, my eyes got opened up pretty quick to that. You know, I eventually yeah. got to air assault, air assault school. That was a blast. I did jump, I did jump master to it took me twice to get through jump master. Um, I went through Jump Master course with uh, Marty Kalukas as an instructor. Oh. Oh, okay. I mean, I mean, I had studs. I competed against Marty Kalukas. Well, I think, let me, let me back up. I didn't compete against Marty Kalukas. I was at the same competition that Marty right, Kalukas right. won. <laughs> exactly. And uh, yeah, he, he won everything. Um, yeah. We was I think it was ninety four. We went to the Lightning Challenge. And I went with uh, Sergeant Campbell. I can't remember Sergeant Campbell's first name. He was a staff sergeant at the time. A really tall guy. I remember at the Ruck, it was really hard because I had basically had to run. Being a little person compared to that dude, I had to run while he was striding it out. And we got to the six-mile turnaround point, roughly. We come around a bend, and I see Marty Klukas screaming, and pointing at Paul Ford, who's laying on the ground, and right. threatening to kill him. He's trying yeah. to, I'll, I'll kill you. I'll, I'll drag your dead carcass around across the finish line. And he turns and he sees us. He goes, Bragg's coming. Hell no, Bragg's not going to beat us. And as we go by, I just turned to Cam. I said, so we slow down? And he goes, nope, we should speed up. And I remember at one point, we were coming back through the back gate, not the back gate of the base, but the back gate where they, where you go through the, there's a lot of weapon storage stuff. Uh, like ammo country yeah, or whatever it was. Ammo there. country, yeah, exactly, back yeah. there. We came through a gate, through, and I, I see it off in the distance, and Campbell's got a hold of my collar at this time. He's driving, he's basically just running with me, and I'm just trying to keep up with him. <laughs> and he's like, they're coming. I look back, and I see Marty Klukas, Dragon Paul Ford, and they're there. There they are. And Paul's like, "He's there. Come on, we gotta go." And I just, I remember I fell a couple times, and he's cussing me. And then the next thing I know, I wake up and I'm in an ambulance, and I'm laying there, and I roll my head to the left, and Paul Ford is passed out beside me. 
he's getting an IV, and I'm getting an IV, and I'm getting an IV, and I got my, they're taking our boots off. His feet are bleeding. I think I know my yeah. I got a big old blood blister in my foot, and what's woken me up is Marty Lucas has grabbed my foot and he's man, good job, Fort Bragg. You guys pushed us, man. You really d-. and I can see my partner behind him, Campbell behind him, and he's like, let him die. I, I hate to keep. Apparently, I had <laughs> fallen right before the finish line, and they passed us. Oh man! So they like they got like third place or whatever. Yeah, so that was that was amazing. The six mile ruck march. I remember coming across the finish line, and not to name drop, but these are the kind of people that that I was competing and looking up to. Was um, Ranger? He's out in Hawaii with uh, Oh Knight. Yeah, John Knight. John, so yeah. I, I'm coming across the finish line, the six miler, and John Knight has already crossed, and he's 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 taking a knee and he's smoking a cigarette and he's like <laughs> yeah. he's like that dog is out and I'm just like who is this dude who, I know it's an who, animal where, where do they make where do they make you dude right it's like you was taking, you know, taking a break, break I was like I gotta go back and get some guys I'll be right back you know it's just like who are you dude <laughs> you know it was it was a it was a I was like man what a, what a community these guys are amazing. oh yeah then I got so I, then I got selected to go down to teach at the schoolhouse. And, I mean, I remember the first FTX I went on as an instructor, we had a big we had a big uh, meeting in one of the flights. And I was told by one of the instructors, hey, man, you got to have a kill, this this rotation. And I'm like, I don't understand what you mean. I have to have a kill. And he goes, yeah. you got to get a wash the dude out. You got to push him until he quits. I'm like, Psh. I knew that. I can yell at anybody. Dude. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't know how many times they barely got me to quit <laughs> yelling right. at me. You know? <laughs> um, so I remember going, going out to the field and I had Airman Najira was his name. I don't know where this dude's at. I hope he's doing good. Um, and he was much like I was as a student. He wasn't the best. He wasn't the worst. He just, he would give you everything he had. Yeah. He was, he was give, doing his best. And he wasn't the best athlete. You could tell he didn't do a lot of sports. But um, I just walked this kid to the point where and he, he was struggling with nabbing. And I knew night nabbing, if it wasn't going to be easier like it was for most of us, it was going to go really, really bad. And it really, really did. It, it mm-hmm. got really, really bad. And so I washed him out. And I remember the next day I was sitting in the graveyard with him. I tried to talk him up. Hey, man, you're going to be fine. I was across training. I, I went to Desert Storm. I wasn't even engine. I wasn't even attack. I was the engine mechanic. I said, "You're going to have an opp- another opportunity, and you may not even come back as attack P. You might be the best combat controller, whatever security forces guy in the world. You know, don't, this is not the end of the world." And I right. crushed that dude's dreams, man. And it hit me at that moment. It's like if I at any point was just a complete asshole to this guy, and not taught this guy anything, it's my fault. Mm-hmm. If I am this amazing master instructor that I'm supposed to be, why couldn't I teach this kid? And I told from that moment on, I was like, from that Nairman Ajira was the, the turning point for me as a, an NCO, as a young TAC P, uh, um, that I had to get give people a shot. I had to mm-hmm. do right by them. You know, and I never washed another kid out. There were plenty of guys that quit, but I did my best. If if they if I couldn't explain something, I'd get somebody else. If I was teaching a class and the guy was like, I just don't get half quick. I just don't get it. I was like, all right, cool. I know such and such is really good at it. I'm going to bring him in. Maybe that will help. I was humble enough to say, hey, look, dude, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you everything I got. I'm going to tell you all everything I, I know about it. If you still don't get it, we'll figure it out. So, yeah. But Airman Ninjira was the guy that I washed out, and uh, it made a big impact on me. And um, I literally, it switched for me. I just, mm-hmm. Just had to, I had to make it about them. I, I didn't have to make it about all that I had done as an NCO or an instructor. It had to be about them. You know what? Yeah, you are. You are 18 years old. You are in Fort Walton Beach. Yep. Every girl wants to get with you. Yeah. But you know what? You don't know that yet. Just right. listen. You know, and I try to do right by people. And um, I really, really, I thought I was a, a fairly good ETAC because I had left. 
uh, to go to the schoolhouse, I was a brand new ETAC. I didn't have a lot of experience. So when I left the schoolhouse, I was a really good five level or three level. I was a really good three level. I showed up in Korea and see my sergeant Brock was at the group at the time. Vivian was coming in to replace him. He took me and gave me my first, first check ride. We went to Bender's Butte in uh, Korea. It's just an OP that they call that named after Bender or he named and um, did my check ride and I absolutely bombed it. I didn't mission plan. I didn't take the time to chair fly it, go over it at all. I just figured I know what I'm doing. I'm yeah. just going from the schoolhouse. And uh, he stopped me in the, in the middle of my check ride. He goes, look, he's closed my nine line and my, my book and stuff. He goes, and he, because I know he's talking to Bender. He goes, all right, man, get ready. You're going to take over the mic and, you know, get your currency, whatever. So yeah. that night I went in my room and I started mission planning. I started chair flying it. I I didn't get too crazy because I'm sure for you as a supervisor, you know, for attack P, you've seen guys that they come in sometimes and they'll have the whole, they're going to say this and I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this and it's yeah. going to go like this. And they're so scripted that as soon as something happens, it's not their script. They don't know what to do. Right. And, uh, you know, I just literally chair flew it and thought about, okay, I'm going to, if I can bring him from this OP or if he makes me send him back from that OP, I know, I know everything I need to know from all the targets in the, in the target area from regardless of what OP uh, or IP he runs in from. So I just really set myself up for it. And it went really, really well. And I got done with it the next day. He's like, who the hell are you? I was like, <laughs> I said, well, I, it's nice to meet you. I'm Staff Sergeant Lee Blackwell. I'm actually doing what I'm doing. He goes, yeah, it, it shows. <laughs> right. so, and it was humbling because, you know, and then they put you in the tra training environment. They All the ASOS as you go in after that, in some capacity, you're always the training per a training person. And mm -hmm. I don't get to work on my skills a lot. I didn't get to perfect my craft and work alongside my peers and people that I respected and to go and control cast with them. And okay, just cause Lee, you know, has done certain things as me, it's the best way to put bombs on target, you know? So yeah, tried, tried to do my best by it. Korea was a good time, but that's when nine 11 happened. I was at getting ready to go to work. And, um, I was on the back half of my one year assignment and 9-11 happened, and uh, I knew that things were never going to be the same. I came back to brag, and it was it was a skeleton. It was people were already downrange. Um, it took me a long time to get downrange, just because it was it happened when it happened, I guess. Yeah. But um, went back to brag. They made me the NCIC of Alpha Flight, and I had just I had Leahy, I had Brogan. I had Prout, I had uh, Jorgensen, who's now a combat controller, Josh Miller, combat controller. I had a couple of guys. I had um, Andy, um, there's another guy, he retired as combat control chief. He was one of my airmen as well. I just, I had stacked dudes. I had really, really good guys. Yeah. And I knew that, you know, we were going to have to go and deploy. Um, and they were, you know, I don't remember how it all, how we all got selected to go, but we went to Kandahar and we had, we were down on the, toward the end of the flight line, the Poles, the Poles were near us. I remember one day, a guy, a Polish guy, AD'd an entire clip of his AK-47 in their, in their fog. Oh and it, you know. And a Bragg kid was cleaning his nine mil one morning and function checked it and shot through the tent and killed the kid oh. sleeping in this tent next to him. Oh my God. We had a guy, an, an NCO, teaching a young private how to fire an AT4 rocket while standing outside the ISU 90 full of, I, of AT4s. The flight line's out in front. Five safeties doing his thing. He cooks off a live AT4, breaks the 
the black back blast breaks the the welds on the container. None of them cook off. Goes right over the flight line as you know planes are taking off and taxiing and shit landing. Man. It's like we all wanted to be on mission because it was safer to be outside the wire. <laughs> no doubt. You know, it was crazy. It was crazy. Um, but we we'd gone on a couple missions. Um, I had uh, the first mission I'd went on. It was a QRF. We I just stayed up to watch the Super Bowl all night long, and I went into my my tent. We had the PJs. They're they're part of our little compound too. Um, went back to my tent. Was getting undressed, laid down, and the alarm red went off. QRF alarm went off. Oh, man. And uh, so. The halo runs in, and I'm trying to put boots on. He's trying to put one of my boots on when I'm putting another one on. <laughs> he's putting, he's trying to dress me. It's so weird. And uh, finally, I told him to get out. I'll be right out. We show up. We we shinook out to uh, kind of the spin bulldog area, and um, we link up with this OD this OD eighteen. Apparently, they had come around the ridge line on their uh, vehicles with their ANA and stuff. And, uh, they saw a couple guys putting IEDs in the ground and they zip tied them up and put bags on their head and interrogated and found out there was a whole bunch of guys up in the mountains up ahead. So they called in QRF and I showed up, there was an ODA. There's a soft tech P I can't remember his name at all. There's a Peoria guard guy that I was with tech sergeant. He and I were together. I can't remember his name either. We're sitting on the, the Chinook, and I'm sitting across from this young kid. He's all bearded out. He looks like he's kind of Hawaiian, Hispanic-looking dude, all tan. And he's just looking at me. And I'm like, well, why is this dude staring at me? He goes, you're Sergeant Blackwell. You were my instructor at Tech B-School. I was I'm like, what? <laughs> he goes, I'm, Aaron, wow. I'm Sergeant so-and-so. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, you were my, my instructor. So I'm like, holy shit. He'd come back. I guess they were getting uh, supplies and stuff and while well, their team was out, so they were linking back up. We were catching a ride with us. But we get out there, and there's was, there was, so there's four ETACs. No one was like, oh, this is an SF mission. This is a 82nd mission. Just, hey, what do you need? Uh, one guy needed me to start converting lat longs to MGRS. One guy was working elevation. And we just started teaming together to figure out uh, what we were going to do. We ended up getting a B-52 and a B-1. We dropped 19 2,000-pound JDAMs. Um, we Winchestered one AC-130. When it was my turn to get on the mic, when it was my turn to get on the mic, uh, the SF S3 was like, well, we got on station. Our SF guy with a long rifle, he's like, we got dismounts coming our way 400 meters out. And they'd handed me the mic and... The S3, so what we got on station, I said Reaper 2 2. And uh, unbeknownst to me, when we kind of moved further back, kind of to separate ourselves from the closest targets, um, we set up a kind of a big perimeter. And we had a Toyota Tacoma with like IR headlights and Mark 19 in the back. And uh, all of a sudden, this the driver's door opens, and this like silverback lowland gorilla, this dude that it's like he's been eating steroids like M&M's <laughs> unfolds out of this little pickup truck. And he goes, I want to put down the Mark. And he crawls in the bed of the truck to get on the Mark 19. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're, you're my Mark. I'll do whatever you say, dude. <laughs> so right. I called up and I said, stand by for Mark. And he puts around out there. And he hops down and gets in the vehicle and he puts the seat back down and he goes back to sleep. I can tell my kids I shot at something. He goes back to sleep. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so then they, they opened up with 40 Mike Mike, and it was it was really, really cool. A Danish F-16 had dropped a, a GBU-12. First time they dropped since World War II, so that made the news. Um, I think it was like one of the largest drops since Anaconda. Definitely not bigger than Anaconda, but it was it went really well. Yeah. Um, and then a couple weeks later, I went on another mission, and uh, nothing really materialized out of that. I got to be on the set on a uh, 50 cal in the back of a vehicle for about seven hours. 
thinking I was the coolest thing ever, you know, <laughs> five hours into eating dust. It's like, this is the dumbest fucking thing I could have done. <laughs> right. I could be asleep right now. This is stupid. Right, right. Sitting on two cases of MREs, realizing I just need to turn the gun. Every time the gun in front of me turns, I got to turn the other way. I gotta, and we're, we're driving in these canyons. It's like, there's nowhere for us to hide, dude. Yeah. If someone wants to light us up, we are dead. There's right. no way we're going to hide. And, you know, then we get to the, the point where they send me out to skin. Uh, I go out with the platoon or a battalion minus out there. And, um, you know, we're going on every mission, Ray and I. And uh, I had not worked directly with Ray in the same brigade back at the 14th, but he wasn't assigned to uh, a, an ETAC. And I didn't have a dedicated one charter for at the time. So I said, he can come with me, man, if he wants to. And the kid was just, you know, he, he was like me. He was older. He came in when he was older. So he was very mature. He was already a very driven young man, very quiet. I knew he was married. I knew that his wife was pregnant uh, and going to have a little, another little girl. And they were, you know, struggling, as young couples do, with deployments and being separated and whatnot. And he was... He would call every now and then on the sat phone, talk to her. He was good. I never had to babysit Ray. I never had to worry about the radios not being, the batteries being charged or the meals ready to go. Or he was always fast packing stuff. He was on, he was on the wads all the time. He, this kid was strapped and it was his birthday and he had turned 24. I think it was 24. I think, I think, I think, I think. but um, he had turned 24. We got started taking, indirect fire uh, artillery fire from Afghan uh, Pakistan we had a, there was a Taliban leader called Muhammad who had a fire base just across the border mm -hmm. and you could see the flash we get in the Delta Tower we had a, a nice camera up there and a nice 50 cal mounted we had our little degrees on the walls and stuff and you could mm -hmm. see out in the original about seven clicks out it looked like and um, you see a flash and about 45 seconds later, we, we, we take rounds. And they're pretty accurate. Yeah. They pepper the yeah. walls. They If they landed inside, definitely they're going to hit something, mm -hmm. whether it's equipment or someone else. But, but luckily, no one ever got hit, but we would always get harassing fire. Um, we went out the next day after his birthday. We went to like Malakase, Mangrate, kind of up that area along the border because we known it was known, you know, well known border crossing areas you know mm -hmm. they were coming across the border into those villages where they were storing weapons or whatever munitions we we go up there and talk to the, the locals and ray would always hit it off with the kids he'd always have some kind of candy to give to him talk to him take pictures with him and he was very personable uh the day we got hit on his birthday i'll back up um he and i we run up in the delta tower and i'm in you know, we're in PT gear, and um, we get up there. I've got the 117 Fox and um, Ray's calling Tombstone to try to get Cass. And I'm like, you know, we can put it up. We'll see. We can get some Cass, but it's it's in Pakistan. We're not we're not going to go after anything in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I said, but you know, it's your birthday. We'll put a put a request up. See if we can get something. So we got a ten showed up, and I said, you need to start working up nine lines. And as we're taking these rounds. Before the plane showed up, Ray is on the back side of the tower, like where rounds would come into easily. I'm up against the front wall, sandbags, so if anything comes, it's going to hit the sandbags or fall behind me. Right. And Ray is just in, 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 when you hear rounds coming down like that, dude, that, that sound, dude, it's like, ooh, it's, it's scary, especially when they come close. And, uh, He's ducking down and trying to get back on the radio and, you know, drops the antenna and picks it back up, puts it back on the wall and he's shaking. And I just grab him and put him underneath me and pull him front to the front of the tower. I'm looking down at him. I can still see his eyes looking at me. He's like, I'm scared. I'm like, well, I'm like, brother, I'm scared too. I said, but you're doing a good job. I said, you're doing your job, man. I said, you're crushing it. I said, get us that air. And he just kept doing his thing. We had a 10 check on station. And uh, so I did the fire fact. 
And I said, look, you know, I'm not going to send you over there. I said, but I have some NIIs that I want you to look at, but I'm going to have my one charter four work you around the area. I said, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, unless you get called for something, I said, that's all the work I got for you. I said, plus it's his birthday. He goes, Shh, tell him I'm ready whenever he is. And he already got to control that day. And I remember nice. I could see him. like He was walking off the tower, walking down the stairs. And I said, Ray. He turned around and I said, happy birthday, dude. How do you like the fireworks? And he goes, I didn't like those fireworks on Blackwell. <laughs> and uh, I said, you did a good job, dude. You did a really good job. Two days later, he was dead. It was so, it was, it was so crazy, man. I remember we were, the day we were coming back from Malacase, uh, we had the interpreter, because the interpreter was leaving when we got back from that mission. He wanted to go check on his family in Pakistan. And um, he had this dog that would follow him everywhere. He never fed the dog. He never gave the dog attention. But this dog was always around when Annette was around. Annette was smart. He'd go to a village. They've got weapons. I'll find them. And Sure enough, he'd find weapons. But this dog would always be around. I remember we would drive. We're driving to the towns, and uh, this, do- this dog's running beside the convoy. It's just running. So we're done doing our thing. We're coming back home. The dog's running. Tongue's hanging out like a belt. Dog jumps in the vehicle to, like, take a break. And we're like, yeah, cool. The dog, yeah, yeah. And takes a mean steamer right in the middle of all of us. Shits in, on the floor between the back two seats, and then hops out, and keeps running, and here we are stuck with this turn. Like, dude. But I didn't remember that that until years later. So every time I get to tell the story, I get I, I want to make sure I tell about the dog because that was so weird. It's like, yeah, oh, yeah the dog is with us. Wait, what? Oh no, just just start <laughs> shitting. But uh, skin was cool. We we went on every mission that we uh, they had every mission. Uh, we did not rest at all, and um, so we we get back from a night mission where we're along the border up on an OP. Ray and I are with with a sniper up on the OP. This little bitty ranger guy, and the gun has got to be taller than the guy standing. It's got to be. This dude is carrying this cannon this artillery piece around like it's right. a Beretta. This dude is a tough dude. He went up that mountain so many times carrying that thing. This dude was just, and I was smoked. I get to the top of this OP and I'm sweating and I'm like, now I'm cold. <laughs> Luckily, nothing ever happened. And we, so we had to walk back, get back to the fob. And I, you know, I said, I'm going to go check in the talk and uh, see if things going on. And so I go in the top, come back and race, putting batteries on charge. He's got meals repacked and stuff. And um, then the talk, talk in seal runs in. He goes, hey, we got dismounts at a cache site. Uh, commander needs you in the talk now. So I go in the talk. Captain Trey hands in there. He goes, Lee, we're going to send a QRF out to the to the border. Uh, to And he's got the rate camera up. We see all these uh, you know military-aged men. Uh, armed, RPGs, RPKs, AKs, just, I mean, they're just loaded. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's basically said, we're going to go find out what they're up to. So we load up at seven or eight vehicles. We didn't have a lot of up armor vehicles, but we had uh, a couple. And um, it felt like we were a bunch of rednecks going to go hunt a deer. Because there was gun barrels sticking out every window. <laughs> you know, we, were, we were in a turtle Humvee crammed in and uh, no room whatsoever. Um, so we get to the, the border, and we're going down in the wadis, and we're getting back up on this ridge, and we dismount, and I'm walking to my left. Ray had just got out of the vehicle. I said, radio up. He goes, yeah, Ray, radio's up. We're walking to the FSO and the, the commander, and all of a sudden, it's just like the entire side of the mountain in front of us just started shooting up. Uh, grenades they were lobbing grenades at us RPGs were being shot at us and I'm saying 20 feet away I mean they're just and there's no there's nowhere to hide there's not a bush there's not a rock there's vehicles to hide behind 
Uh, but a lot of those aren't up, up armor. They're soft skin. Yeah. No doors on them. And uh, so we hit the ground. I've, I'm probably 15 feet from Captain Trahan, FSO, and I'm looking for cover. And uh, I turned to Ray. I said, call Tombstone, tell troops in contact, 1972 enable. He goes, roger that. So he starts going through the radio, doing his thing. And I looked to my far right. And I saw an up armor vehicle with 50 cal on top. And the dude is shooting straight down. That's how close the dudes are to us. And uh, they can hear the snaps and the whizzing. And it's just like really, really, really intense. And then I look in front of me and I see this guy on the other side of the ridge line of the wadi. He's leans out from behind a boulder he's got an RPG on the shoulder and he shoots it right and it cooks off right between Ray and I and it's like I look at him he looks at me I'm like holy that is that's intense and I'm like okay we got it we got it we got to get out of this location this is you can hear guys getting shot guys are screaming guys are cussing guys are mad as shit they're getting shot uh, guys are crying it's just chaotic and it's no there it's cover so i said grab the ruck i have the antenna he goes what i said we're moving let's go and we started running it was like running in mud dude like running in molasses i could not get there fast enough so i get there fall down behind the back of the vehicle and i start patting ray down and i said he's like what are you doing i'm like just making sure you're not shot i said you need to check me so we, we did that. You good? I'm good. You good? I'm good. So we low crawled up by the front passenger tire. I am directly beside the tire. Ray is directly beside me. And I'm looking right over the ridge line. I can see dudes trying to get back into Pakistan, running from boulder to boulder, hiding, trying to get back into Pakistan. Above us, there's a checkpoint, Pakistani checkpoint. I can see them looking down on us. Uh, north of me, probably a click at least is the main border checkpoint we were just at a couple days before so I'm making sure nothing I don't hear anything coming from that direction and uh, I'm just kind of scanning okay okay I'm looking east all right it's gonna be north to south south to north reciprocal no east to west or reciprocal because I can't go into Pakistan and back so it's gonna be north and south south to north right to be a show of force and so he, he's gonna he goes, we got fighters. And I said, okay, call sign, ETA, tell me something. He, mm -hmm. he goes, all right, stand by. So at that moment, the 50 gunner's standing above me now. So I wanted to tell the driver we were laying there. Because I remember being in JRTC years before, and we, the, the talk had jumped in the middle of the night. And you don't put your camo nets down. You just park your vehicles in the morning. You kind of fix things up. Well, we had jumped in the middle of the night, and I remember somebody had to go back to where we had jumped from to get the rest of the people to our location. And he drove her over some people sleeping in their sleeping bags. He didn't wake up his ground guide to ground guide them out of the Italian area, the talk area. And um, so I remember, that's what I was thinking when I was sitting in Afghanistan, looking over the edge beside a vehicle. I was like, I need to tell the dude I'm laying here. I don't want him driving over me. One, I'm going to lose, lose my cover if I need it. Two, I don't want this dude to kill me. So I stand up, and I remember going to open up the driver's, the passenger front door. But the window was down. You don't ever leave the windows down. And I'm, I'm armored. You leave them up. So I opened up the back door. Took some shots at the door. 50 gunner is just cussing away. Just get some, get some. He's like just yelling, and brass is coming down. You had that smell. I yelled inside the door at the driver. I said, you got two guys right by the front tire. If you need to leave, lay on the horn and we'll get in. He goes, roger that. And Ray yells at me and he said, blue zero three in five minutes. So now no, I got a Danish F-16, Norwegian Danish EPAF F-16. So I got a language barrier. I got two GBU-12s. I got an air-to-air -air gun and an AIM-9. It's not going to help me. It's going to be a show of force. Right, right. So the last thing I s told Ray was, stay behind your ruck, you'll be fine. 
in that instant, the 50 gunner gets shot in the forehead. And he falls. I thought he was dead. He falls, collapses inside the vehicle onto the ground. So I crawl in over this kid, roll him over, expect to see his head like just like a watermelon. And I roll him over and he's, he's just trying to, he's blinking. And he's just trying to get his eyes to focus. The round had hit his Kevlar. The impact on the Kevlar hit his head. When it hit his head, it cut his forehead open. The edge of the, the Kevlar cut his forehead open. But he's fine. He's just knocked out. And that's what I told him. The dude, you just got knocked the F out. He's like, I'm fine. And he's just trying to, I'm fine. Um, and then the driver, the windshield is just spider, man. It is nothing but you can't see out of it. Yeah. And um, he's screaming. He's got glass windshield shards in his face from the impacts on the windshield. Yeah. And he's like, get on the 50, get on the 50. I'm like, you get on the 50. I've got F-16s coming. So that time is when the door starts just banging into me. And I step down. And uh, I'm looking through the window of the door at Ray. And he's sitting back and he's holding his face. And he's kicking the door. And I don't know that he's been shot right here. His whole lower jaw is gone. And blood's coming out like a faucet through his fingers. And, uh, dude, that was the most graphic and most violent thing I've ever seen in my life. And the, the look in his eyes was the most helpless and scared look I've ever seen in my life. It was, it was, it was bad, dude. Because I get to him, I go around the door, and I'm speaking in colorful language, obviously. I get on him. And uh, I tried to pull him back, drag him back behind the vehicle. And I kept falling down because, like, it's like sandy and gravelly, and he's heavy, and I'm heavy. And I got all the gear. I kept falling down. I had no saliva in my mouth. It was so dry. It was unbelievable how hard it was to talk because I could not, I couldn't. It's like body fluids stopped working, you know. And, uh, I get him behind the vehicle. And I tell him, I said, you got to help me, brother. And he's kicking the ground as I'm dragging him backwards. And I'm holding on to him now. And I'm screaming to my left because everybody's left of me. And uh, I'm screaming for the medic. And I know I got a bunch of dudes shot to shit. We got a lot of guys really shot up pretty bad. We have one medic. And I know I'm combat lifesaver qualified. I don't have a CLS bag. You know, something else I screwed up on. And um, I I felt helpless. I, I felt like I it's going to be my fault when he dies. And I uh, kept screaming for the medic. And then the vehicle starts backing up over me. And I'm holding Ray. I'm just holding him, cradling him, looking down at him, talking to him. And I'm banging on the door, the back of the vehicle. And the guy gets out. out goes, oh, shit. Because at one point I had to lay Ray down to crawl forward to get the ruck, the radio, the antenna, our weapons, and drag them all back, pick Ray back up, got back on the radio, and I heard Blue Zero Three, because I could hear Blue Zero Three calling when the radio was still by the tire. So I crawled up, laid him down. I said, I'll be right back, brother. I got you. Let me, I, we got fighters coming. Just hold on, man. And uh, I low crawled up, drug everything back. I said, Blue Zero Three, hard work one one, stand by. I just put the mic down. I didn't worry about air. I wasn't thinking about air. I was just worried about Ray. Because he's looking up at me. And he's pulling. He's clawing. He's just pulling at me. And blood is pouring like, like a faucet coming out. And there's like teeth. And there's bones. And there's flesh. And there's just shit all over me. It was really hard. It was really fucking hard. And uh, it was hard. And uh, kept screaming for the medic. I got to get the medic here. And uh, now he's not, he's not moving a lot. He's 
I'm told, someone told me it was agonal breathing, what they call it, agonal breathing. It's when your body's fighting to stay alive, and, you know, fight to keep working. You'd have those gasps every now and then. And uh, I remember at one point, artillery starts coming down, 105s. And it's like, and it's in the ravine right in front of me, like 50 feet in front of me. The FO, Specialist Reed, probably Sergeant Major, Command Sergeant Major Reed now. The dude is, he went SF. He's JTAC qualified, just an absolute stud now. But he's been hit by two grenades. It disabled his M4, and all he has was his mic. And he's calling in artillery. And he's smoking dudes. But he's putting them so close because that's how close they are to us. And I remember at one point, I grab, I'm holding Ray, and debris is coming down, and to hear multiple rounds, and I mean multiple rounds of 105 coming in on you, hear the impact, the explosion, and all that shit coming down on you. Dude, I, I knew I was going to die. I knew I was going to die. It was, it was unreal unreal and uh um at one point it's the craziest thing in the world i see two soldiers low crawl behind the back left side of the tire or the vehicle one was a female and i was just like what are you doing here it's just like i'm telling mom you're you're in trouble and she i don't know she was a driver or whatever i, I don't know what but they had a combat lifesaver back and we started working on Ray. And I I would not let him go. They were they were trying to get me to lay him down. I wouldn't let him go. I said, you can have his arm. His arm is right there. And I would not let him go. I'm sorry. Um, so those two soldiers, man, they worked their ass off to help Ray. And they got an IV in him. I don't know how they did it. I couldn't do it. I, I tried and I tried. It was slippery. I didn't do a lot of that part because I was so covered in blood and I was super, everything was super slippery at the time. Yeah. It wasn't sticky yet. So we got an IV in him and we, I said, let's put him in the vehicle. Let us put him in the vehicle. I said, I'll, I'll put him in the vehicle. And uh, so I laid him in the vehicle back to the home B and um, he's gone and about that time Captain Trahan he got shot six times twice in each leg twice in one arm one in the other arm one went in his cavalier came right back out um, Private Dennis got shot a bunch of RTS got shot the FO got shot and they they were loading a bunch of guys up in a couple of like Toyota Hiluxes, a couple cargo Humvees and stuff, and they were leaving to my right, which is south, and they're going down the Wadi, crossing the, and going back to the fire base. But what we did not know was the insurgents were now flanking us. They were coming around the right, to our right, and they were going to flank us and come up behind us. So when they were doing that is when all the wounded loaded up the vehicles were going down the hill, so they opened up on vehicles full of wounded dudes. Jeez. And that's when Private Dennis was running for cover and got shot in the butt. And it blew out his groin, his femoral artery. And it took us like seven hours to find him. Um, so at that point, Lieutenant Milan, the platoon leader, is yelling for everybody to fall back. We needed to regroup because we started. They hit us and we're all spread out on top of the ridge line and we were taking ground effectively, but we weren't taking it together. Yeah. So we were going to start shooting across each other. So if we mm -hmm. fell back, regroup, took the ground effectively, we would be more effective. So we, we fall back and I, I'm running. I got two weapons. I am from my chin to my toes. I am bright red and I'm got a radio and I'm 
Call of Duty Zero Three. I got two weapons. I got a tax at Nintendo trying to hold up and run. I sit down on the ground. I sit on next to the Lieutenant Dolan, the FSO. And he goes, "Oh Jesus, you're you're shot." And I'm like, "No, no, it's not me. It's Ray. Yeah. So Ray's gone." And uh, I reached out to Blue Zero Three, and no response. And so I tried again once I got established next to the FSO and nothing. I can hear him calling me. I'm like, okay, all right, all right. We, we got connection, but we don't have connection. All right, let's go secondary. So I went secondary secure, nothing. Went back to primary in the red, nothing. Secondary red, no. Green, red, nothing. Couldn't get him. I was really frustrated. Hmm. And the FSO, the radio's in the rock. I never even pulled it out, but so that RTO is helping me, and, and that's when I realized was when the radio was shot that I could receive, but I couldn't transmit. Because what's happening now is Blue Bore Five Two is checking on with Blue Zero Three, Two A Tens is checking on with the Two F Sixteens, and I'm like, oh, thank God, man, A Tens. Yeah. And um, I'm sitting there next to Lieutenant Dolan, and. The medevac has already landed at the fire base. The two Apaches that escorted it have pushed forward. Ace 1 1. So they push forward. And as I see them, and I can't talk to anybody, I hear Blue, Blue Zero 3 talking to Bore 5 2. They're talking to each other. And I'm like, wait a second. FSO has FM. He has cigars. Ace 1 1 has an FM. Bore has an FM. And all my little wheels inside my brain started, okay. I think I, I can do this. And I just, I said, sir, call X111, tell them to call 4532. He's like, what? I'm like, tell the Apaches, call the A10s. I need to talk to him. And he's handing me his mic. He says, you can do it better than I can. He handed me the mic. And he says, that's your RTO. And it, he had followed me around. And at one point during the skirmish, we had very sporadic fire. And uh, I had a total that day of eight Apaches. Um, at one point, six of them were around. I had four A-10s, two F-16s, two Harrys, and a B-1. And I didn't drop a bomb because we couldn't find private dentists. But I just I had to, no map, no nothing on a, on a fire's net. I said, okay, I've got to deconflict this. And I said, okay, what's, what's your min max? What's your gun and target line? I pushed the fighters a thousand, you know, thousand feet above that. I pushed all the rear wing surface to 300 north of that gun to target line. So I had a, you know, impromptu, you know, airspace deconfliction and just started making shit happen. And um, blue, bore five one checks on station and uh, he checks on he goes hey, hard rock this is bore confirm you're the non ray attack and I was like they think I'm Ray they think I'm dead and Ray is here wow the system really worked they sent a fac A out here I had a SF soft tack P I was told coming from Bagram to my location all because everybody thought Ray was by, by himself and I was dead. Uh, and uh, so the pot, I tell him, I said, no, I'm Hard Rock 1 1. 1 1 Bravo is down. I am 1 1 actual. He goes, stand by. And he calls back Tombstone. And eventually, Colonel Pope, who's in Ramadi in, F in Iraq, gets the word because he's been told I'm already dead. He's already been told I'm dead. Mm -hmm. And, well, at least that's at some point in this past 20 years, I've heard that. So I've yeah. attached that to it i don't know how true that is so let me first say that um because right. as an old man sometimes factual things are just what i thought things happened because i'm right. that freaking old <laughs> but um you know i said yeah i'm i'm hard work one one actual and he goes after he came back and he goes, what do you need i said i need you to maintain the stack i said i need you to and this is before Type one, two, three, BOC, BOT. This not this is all positive procedural control. Or so right. ETACs, it's all hey, this kind of hey man, 
I want you to control fix wings. I'm going to talk to the rotary wings. I've got a lot of moving parts down here I need to keep an eye on. I need to show the forces, and I let them know when the air, the artillery was shut down and where the art, the, the rotary wing was at. I, I can tell you what a B1 looks like at about 1,000 feet. Um, some, some amazing things happened in a very violent and very graphic situation. I couldn't have been with better dudes. It's like you wanted to pick a fight with these dudes that have been sitting on this fob for so many months and you've been shooting at them. You want to pick a fight with these dudes? These guys are ready. And they, yeah. they did an amazing job. They really, really did. Um, but what's been hard for me all these years is when we got back that night, we had a SF doc. I think he was from the University of Texas. Because I was really, I was told after the, during the firefight, I was told Ray was, it made it back and he's fine. At the end, we were back the base of the uh, ridge line. We were all where the, the ambush happened and we were loading up. I was told that he didn't make it. And I was like, no, 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 bullshit. So and so told me, we, he's good. He's like, no, I didn't make it. And uh, so I was really having a tough time. I was, so then I got to the point in that seven hours where I got really, really sticky. Then I got, I had dry blood on me all day. Just, I was yeah. covered in it. I couldn't get it off of me. I kept trying to wipe my hands in the, in the dirt. Couldn't stop seeing it. Couldn't stop seeing his eyes looking at me. There, there's a lot I cannot remember about that day as far as seeing those things. I know things happened, but I can't remember a lot of things. It's like my yeah. brain is no, you don't, you don't need to. It's not going to do you any good to remember what that looked like, you know. Right. And, and I'm thankful for that. But I do. Just this last year, I was hunting in Georgia with my brother-in-law, and we had we had caught a pig in the trap, and he's going to kill it. We had a 45. He's going to kill it. No big deal. We're going to skin it. And uh, he shoots the first time, and the second time. This thing is like T-Rex, man. It's not going down. And at one point, he shoots it. And everything from April 25th, 2003 comes back. Everything. Because the sound that that pig was making, trying to breathe, shot through the face multiple times, was exactly, and I lost my shit. Dude, I said, I need to step away. I'll be right back. And I, it, it's it's really every now and then it, it, it grabs a hold of me and it it really, it really makes it hard. Yeah. Um, but I did nothing. I did nothing special. I, I I think I failed in a lot of ways that day. Um, I blame myself a lot for Ray uh, dying. I know that. Every one of my techie brothers would have done it a lot better than I would have done it. But all I can say is I did my best. And um, I wish it would not have gone the way it did. And I, and I apologize. I jump around a lot. Um, it just kind of comes out sometimes that way. I think yeah. of certain things. But we got back to the fire base. And, I, and the, the, the doc pulled me aside. He goes, Lee, I, I, want, to, I want to tell you something. And this dude, man, what, what a great human being. He goes, Lee, if I was laying beside you, and Ray was shot, he'd be dead. And there's no way I could save him. He's not going to make it. We got him stable, and he's on his way to Bogdan, so he's not going to make it. The, the, the amount of trauma, the, 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 what just happened to him is that he can't recover from. And, of course, he was right. But So we had a couple – Civilian guys at our fob, and uh, apparently they had a no-go pill, no-go pills. I, I've never, I've always been a conventional guy, never been an SF tac P, never worked with the Rangers, never done first one in, last one out. Who cool badass guy? I was just a conventional dude, just an A second dude, and uh, never got to experience go no-go pills or you know whatever. Um, he goes, you need to take that and. The, the other guy had some like Russian vodka. He goes, and drink that. I'm like, no, nah, dude, I can't do that. He's like, why? I said, I got to pack up his stuff. I got to pack up his belongings. 
And the next day, they sent me back to Kandahar. Alex Miller replaced me in Brett Davidson. Brett Davidson was the one Charlie Four for Alex Miller. That's who replaced me. And I remember being on the plane with all the QRF guys that came out. And they were just staring at me. And I had all these bio bags from all his shit that he had on them and his personal stuff. And I got back to the, the unit at Kandahar and I said, all right, let's get everybody in the day room, in the, in the TV room. I said, I don't want to tell this a bunch of times. And I sat down, I sat there and cried, told everybody what happened. And uh, I said, and the ALO, who was from Peoria, the major, he's like, hey, man, you're on the next C-17 out of here. I was like, I can't go home. You cannot send me home like this. I'm like, why? I said, because if I go home, I have to be a dad. I have to be a husband. I have to be a supervisor. I have to be Lee. I have to. I can't function right now. I don't know how to put on my pants, dude. I, I'm broken inside. I said, oh, leave me here. Let me, I'll, I'll pull talk duty. I'll, I'll go on missions. I need to be here with the guys. We had just lost Jake Frazier two weeks before. I think it was two weeks. I went to his memorial service. It was very powerful. So I'm sitting there one day and no one's letting me work. So I just felt really odd. Hey, man, go go game. Why don't you go play Halo? Because I, I, I sucked at Halo. Everybody loved, loved me playing Halo because I'd always get killed everywhere. I, they'd be behind me. I wouldn't know how to operate my weapon. So they said, hey, man, just go, go game for a while. I'm like, I, I felt like I was the guy who was on vacation. Everybody else is in Afghanistan fighting a war. I just, it felt really weird. And uh, I just I felt out of place. And, uh, and, you know, they sent me home. You know, a couple of weeks before I was supposed to go home, Jimmy Seabrooks took my spot. And what a, what a phenomenal man that, that, that guy is, Jimmy Seabrooks. Um, and then I just started training. Because in my mind, and I take I take this to my grave. I'll always have this mindset. What if it, what if it was me? Did I do my job as a supervisor good enough that Ray could pick that mic up and talk to the planes in that in that situation right then? Could he have passed the nine line? Could he have been legible? Could he have been accurate? Could he have passed good grids? Yeah. Well, I don't know. But I will say this. Next dudes to go down range with me, they will be. Yeah. And but I will also know how to do their job because as supervisors, we don't have to load the wads anymore. We're not doing the radios. We're not doing the vehicles. No, screw that. I went and started doing radio checks. I was in, I was responsible for airman stuff. I demanded my guys to so say you will control cast because I grew up controlling cast by learning from a an ETAC that would be on the do the whole mission planning. To the whole nine line, hand me the mic to say cleared hot, and that was my control. Yeah. That's how I grew up being an ETAC. Pass the mic. Right. I was like, dude, come on, man. Yeah. You, you, we, and I demand, I tell people every day now, I said, you got to be ready for your worst day. You have to be ready. Army's never going to leave when they say they're going to leave. They're never going to get to where they say they're going to get to. Shit's always going to happen. Right. If it, and if it all happens well, then I'm glad. I'm happy for you, dude. But mm-hmm. something's going to happen. Something's going to break down. Something's going to go stupid sideways. And you had better be ready to be do your J-O-B. Yeah. And you better not be giving your supervisors, your peers, anybody flack if they're just asking you to do your job. And you're pissing right. and moaning about that. Who screwed up? The dude asking you to do your job or the dude not want to do his job. Come on, man. Yeah, right. So I, I got really, I kind of became an asshole. I got really kind of strict with the guys. So I remember the day that Colonel Pope got on the PA at the 14th day sauce and called me to his office. And I was like, son of a bitch. I had a feeling. <laughs> and I walk in there. Colonel Pope's a tall dude. What a, what a great ALO. What a great ALO. I've had some really great ALOs. I've had some really crappy ones, but I've, I've, when I needed them, I've had some really good ones. Um, Colonel Pope is standing in his office, and he's looking. He's got his arms crossed. He's doing this, and he's looking up at his personnel board. You know, he's got little things. Oh, the, all these people in Afghanistan. All these people in Iraq. These people, all this guy's oh, maternity leave with his wife. And all I can see is Blackwell. 
black boy's got nothing by his name. And I'm like, I know we got a rotation. You're ready to go to Iraq because guys in Iraq got a guy going to come back. And I'm like, dude, no way, man. Screw that. And because uh, I was not afraid to go deploy. Let me say that first and foremost. I was afraid to see another one of my buddies get shot and die like that. Yeah. I can do, I, I send me anywhere you want to send me. I'll do my job. I just didn't want to see another dude die. Sure. Like that. I, it just it broke my heart. And I cared about these people. There's Dallas Pipes. There's Jorgensen. There's Josh Miller. There's Ben Dig. There's, there's these young, uh, amazing young airmen and NCOs. You know, um, Jeff Leahy, Mike Prout, Yarborough, um, Brogan. Um, gorilla, just I mean, if I lose one of those dudes, come on, man, it's like taking yeah. one of my arms off, man. These they're right. family to me, and Ray was family to me. I did not want to, I didn't want to do it, man. I don't want to. So I, I walk in the office and I stand next to Colonel Pope. You know, I'm five, five foot nothing. I kind of just mirror what he's doing. He's looking at the board. I'm looking at the board. I'm not showing my hand. Not volunteering for nothing. I'm like, whatever, dude. Mm. Give me your best speech. He goes, well, looks pretty thin. And I'm looking up there. I'm like, yeah, looks really thin. The 14th is skeleton. And um, he goes, you heard we got another rotation going to Iraq. I was like, nope. He goes, what do you think? I said, what do I think about what? He goes, what do you think about going? I was like, are you asking me? Or are you telling me? He goes, of course they I'm asking you. I said, well, sir, if you're telling me, I don't know if I'm going to go or not. He goes, why wouldn't you go? I said, I just don't want to see another guy get killed. He goes, Lee, we're never going to know when that's going to happen. He goes, what have you been doing since you've been home? I said, I've been training. I've been training my guys. I, they've got to be ready. He goes, well, why? Why? Why have you been training? I said, so they got to be ready for the worst day. These guys, they don't have a clue how bad it can get. I said, so you mean to tell me? He said, you mean to tell me you've been making sure my guys are ready to deploy, that they're at their absolute best. I'm like, yes, sir. He goes, hmm. I'm like, what kind of Vulcan mind tricks are you pulling on me here, sir? What's going on? Right. He goes, I'll tell you what. Why don't you go home and talk to your family, your wife, and see. If you come back tomorrow and say you don't want to deploy, I'll find someone else. Even if I have to reach out to another ASOS, I'll find someone else. Anybody gives you a hard time, I'll crush them. Don't worry about it. I said, all right. So I'll go home. Tell my ex, I say, hey, you know, there's another deployment coming up. She hasn't deployed yet at all. But what my ex did, she had worked at kind of like the command post. They get a lot of information came in from Iraq and Afghanistan. So she was going to be one of those key people that, to hear if something were, were to happen, you know. And uh, so I was like, yeah, they got another rotation going to Iraq. And she goes, yeah. What are you going to do about it? I was like, well, what should I do? And she goes, Honestly, I said, yeah. She goes, I think you need to get off your ass and do your job. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Damn, love you too. <laughs> and I went, and uh, I, was, I was nervous. I micromanaged them. I babied them. I didn't send any more people that needed to go outside the wire for the first few times. And uh, I was, I was just trying to protect everybody. Mm. And I was, I was the top bitch. My job was to be in the top. I was the inside C. Wasn't my brigade. I had to establish a rapport. Had a horrible rapport with that staff. Took a long time to get it to work, but um, that was my job. I wasn't supposed to be a, you know, controlling. It was, it was Brogan, Leahy, Proud, Grilly. All those studs were supposed to go out and do their thing. And they had phenomenal airmen to go with them. And um, so I I consumed myself with working in the top. I didn't sleep much at all. I tried to micromanage everybody, tried to protect everybody all I could. One day we were, I was in the, in the room trying to sleep in the middle of the day. And uh, we had a big, big, big generator that was bigger than the generator for the base. Colonel Pope, who was a Ramadi, had sent to us to power our building. And they already kept trying to take it from us. And uh, but anyway, 
the airman had let it run out of gas. Sergeant Blackwell, man, come unglued. Instructor Blackwell came out, and I started losing my. And Leahy immediately just, dude, calm down. Just you know, petting the, the dumb animal, not trying to breathe. And uh, he goes, Do you trust me? And I was like, Yeah, sure. He goes, Those guys just leave. Do you trust me? Like, yes. It's hot, man. Come on. Trust me. And they made them take all the jerry cans, walk them more than a mile to the fuel point, carry them back more than a mile. We never ran out of fuel. And I, I, and one day we had a big mission where we we're going to go and take down Fallujah. We're going to go lock down all four corners and close in and take it down. We're going to have Kai was on the west side. We are going to be on the east side, and we're going to go room to room, and start clearing Fallujah of all the bad people. And uh, actually, it was just, the mission we were going to do was going to be just a show of force. Hey, we're going to go into Fallujah. We're going to go to the weapons market because they they didn't want us going in certain places. Yeah. And the weapons market was right by the bridge where they burned the hung the guys on the bridge. All right. That's right where you come out in Fallujah, right by that bridge, right where they did that. And uh, so we're going to go there and just do a show of force. Dismount, walk through the, the market, and just kind of meet and greet, and get back in the vehicles and come back to the, to the fog. And uh, go back to the to hooch. And uh, it's kind of odd because there's not a lot of people around. Not a lot of NCOs, and all of a sudden, here's commotion out out back, and either Brogan or Leahy said, "Hey, can I talk to you out back?" I was like, "Sure." So I go out there, and all my NCOs are out there, and I'm like, "What's up?" And I'm like, "Sorry, Blackwood, you're going on this mission." And I'm like, "What?" You know, like, you're going on this mission. He's like, "Well, I don't know if you realize who's in charge, <laughs> but uh, it would be me, and my job is not to go on missions." And certain Leahy said. You're hiding in the talk or something to that effect and okay. i was like i squared up on it. I was like, what'd you say to me he was like i'm about to calm down just, just hear me out was, uh Leahy, brogan prowl really i don't know if really really might have been really did some wild stuff man he may not have been there but yarborough was there and uh he said your stuff's already loading the vehicle man you're going and i said i will go on this mission as long as no airmen go on this mission. It's got to be all NCOs. I said, well, Dallas Pipes is driving the vehicle, but he's staying with the convoy. He's not dismounted. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. Not a problem. So, get the vehicles, mount up. Grilly is there because I got pictures of him on that mission. Uh, Yarborough, Huss, Donovan Huss is there. What a, what a great guy. What a great guy. Um, and, uh, we're driving into Fallujah, go under the clover leaf, take a right to go north by the train station, and they're burning tires. They start burning tires. And I'm like, come on, guys. This, if this is a movie, this is where the music would start being dramatic. Come on. <laughs> is no one else's hair in the back of their head standing up? Come on. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm just thinking all the bad things. And, uh, and then I try to talk myself off this off the cliff. I'm like, dude, you got this. Just, just monitor your radius. All you gotta do is monitor your radio. You got this. Keep an eye on your buddies. Take care of your guys. You're gonna, gonna be fine. And as soon as we got to the other side, the, the north side of the, the weapons market, we dismounted. I just went into go mode. I, there was no there was no dry mouth, there was no nerves, there was no I just I just got back on the bicycle and started doing my thing. I had a Cairo warrior on station it wasn't dedicated to us but it was there in case something kicked off so we walk through the market we get to the very end bridge is to my right i'm like that's that bridge and Huss is like yeah that's that bridge and um and we got we got back we walked back up to the vehicles and we're walking to the vehicles and i hear this guy let's step it up air force well like, yeah whatever and he goes you're why is the air force guy always gotta be the slowest i look up it's A. Martin. He's a tack B guy, <laughs> cross yeah. combat control. Yeah. And he's he's got a silence on his weapon. He's got all this Gucci gear on. I'm like, what are you doing here? He goes, We're we're just we're shadowing your stuff. We're looking at some stuff for tonight and using you guys as you know to blend in. Nice. Middle, of, middle of Fallujah, I saw A. Martin. That's the last time I saw him. Until I spoke this 
April at Bragg, I saw Abe because Abe yeah. was Ray's supervisor. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, crazy times, man. I could not have been. I got back to the FOB and I took all the NCOs out back. I said, "You guys will never know." I told Leahy this this past April at the twenty year reunion. I said, "You guys never know what you guys did to me, for me." You right. helped me when I was at my lowest. I I, did, I I didn't even believe in myself. I had no confidence. I I had a lot of blame. My fault. You know, it's it because of me. And uh, that's not something I live in and swim in anymore. You know, and I'm I'm thankful for the times I've had, um, and that I was able to be there when it, when shit got really bad. But. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's twenty years later and it still still hits home, man. It still impacts me. I still have the you know the tinnitus ringing in the ears is really bad. Um, uh, I just have a hard time believing in myself. You know, I, I I struggled, and I had an opportunity when my ex got picked by name to go to the Air Force Academy to work at the hospital there. I, I started putting my feelers out. Try oh I'm gonna go to Fort Carson. I'll give up my J if there's no J billet. I'll go be a PME instructor or academy instructor if I have to, just to keep the family together. And then Mike Bender reached out to me. Chief Bender reached out to me. He was a master sergeant at the time. He was at the academy skydiving. He goes, Lee, why don't you come here?" I'm like, "Well, I'm not free fall qualified. I'm just static line, I'm static line jump master. I've not gone to free fall." Uh, he goes, just go get your A license because they jump javelins, civilian rigs at the academy. Right, anyway, right. It's not MC4s or whatever the new rigs are now. He goes, it's all civilian. He says, go get your A license. You get your A license, I bet you I can get you hired. So I went and did my 25 jumps. And um, they said, hey, we're going to go to Gila Bend. For, they, every spring break, the academy, Wings of Blue, goes to Gila Bend for two weeks. And they just do jumps every day. You get like 10 jumps a day. And out of 100 people, we get about 5,000 jumps in two weeks. They just jump. Just go, go, go. And I'm a camera flyer, so I would have a rig ready to go when I hit the ground to keep going. So I'd go to Hilo Bend for a, you know impromptu job interview for them to see how I fly as a, you know, an A-licensed skydiver. And uh, I go out there. I meet Colonel Oates, the commander, Bender, a bunch of the students, a bunch of the staff. And... Uh, and Bender's like, hey, we're going to go up and do a four-way together so we can see how you fly with other people around. I'm like, cool, sounds good. And I was trash. I was shit. I was just flying all over the place. Right. And I uh, get to the ground, I, I flare, and I go to land, and I feel this. It felt like my left ankle broke. And I knew I, at the time I had a plate and five screws in my left ankle because when I had that rollover accident at the, cat, at the schoolhouse, I crushed the left ankle and crushed the right foot oh, so they pin they pin the left ankle so when i landed um i felt i thought i felt that plate break mm -hmm. and i couldn't move my foot up and down i was like oh shit oh, i'm screwed this is gonna look bad they're definitely not gonna hire me so i'm walking off and i'm hobbling and bender's like what's the matter i'm like i think i broke the plate in my ankle he goes well how do you know and i pulled my pant leg up and i said look there's the screw and the screw was sticking out of my ankle like that oh gosh and i was like he's like oh, oh. you know i'm like dude it's all good it's all good i got there's no feeling it's in the bone and he's like oh dude no no i'm like <laughs> he goes sit down we'll get the ambulance over and i was like I need everybody to calm down. <laughs> and all these moments, people get out of control. I said, calm down. Right. I said, I'm fine. I said, I just need to get to where we pack our parachutes into the case band and we'll figure it out. So I'm sitting in there, got my parachute out. And people are like, oh, he's broke his, he broke his ankle. His pin sticking out. So people are all coming around and I'm looking at it. And I'm like, man, I'm going to have to go to Luke Air Force Base. That's a two-hour drive from Hila Bend. They're going to x-ray it. They're going to give me Motrin. They're going to put a band-aid over where it popped through the skin. And then I'm going to be jumping tomorrow. I'm like, ah. I said, anybody got a screwdriver? And they're like, what? I was like, what are they going to do when I get to the loop? They're going to screw it back in. I said, somebody got a screwdriver, I'll screw it back in. I'm like, no way. 
So all the other camera flyers came over there, had their ha helmet cameras going, and they'd say, all right, go ahead. So I grabbed the screwdriver, and I just screwed it straight back into my ankle. And I could, I, I could move my foot. I was like, I'm fine. I went up to Colonel Oates. That's I said, Sir, awesome. I'm, I went back to Colonel Oates. I said, sir, I'm good to go. I'm, I can jump. He goes, no. He goes, what happens if you go up there? There you land and your ankle shatters and someone finds out I let you screw in your own screw in your ankle and go jump more. I said, sir, all they're going to do is x-ray it, take the band-aid off, x-ray it, put the band-aid back on and give me Motrin. I have a tub of Motrin in my room. Medic's got a band-aid and so-and-so had a screwdriver. I said, I'm good. He goes, you got to go to Luke. I went to Luke, walked in. Jeez. And he, what happened? I was like, uh, broke, thought I broke the plate, my ankle. They x rayed it, put the band aid back on. You need more motor? Nope. All right. Next day I was jumping. Nice. And they hired me. And uh, <laughs> the very next jump I had, my first jump at the academy, I burned in for 12,000. 12, I was jumping a, familiar, a fam jump with one of the pilots, Lieutenant Colonel Pescio, who was a major at the time. He jumped out at 12,000. At 5,000, he wanted me to track off and open. And he was going to take it down to the bottom and open. And he wanted because he wanted to watch my landing pattern, my, my canopy skills. I was going to fly pattern and stuff. So, jumps uneventful. I'm doing my thing around him. He, he does this, wave off. So I turn, start tracking off, and I'm flying right towards Pike's Peak. And I'm like, man, what a cool i'm looking around there's carson over there Kennedy's back over there i'm just like man i'm like god man this is such a what, those trees are getting big those trees are getting <laughs> holy so i pitched out and what i didn't realize i was below a thousand feet my cypress had fired oh no my fight my the the bag the reserve comes up hits me in the face and i'm like what and i look and this thing goes off goes off my arm starts going up in the air the reserve is wrapped around my arm from my armpit to my elbow. It's wrapped up, and I can't. So that's wrapped up. That's the reserve that I've opened. Yeah. The main is wrapped up in itself. So the next mistake I make is I pull this steering toggle. It sends me into a spin. As it sends me into a spin, I start getting wrapped up in both canopies. And I'm looking at the ground. I'm like, I'm going to hit that sign. I'm going to hit that sign. I'm going to hit that tree. I'm going to hit that tree. And I hit the ground like I was laying in the bed flat. That's exactly how I hit the ground. Bam. And I, I bounced over. And now I'm laying on my side. And I look and I roll back over. And I'm in this small, like, six-foot tree bush thing. One canopy's laying there. The other one's wrapped around me. And I'm trying to catch my breath because I completely knocked the air, wind out of me. That is... I want to say day four or, or jump four or jump five for the students that are jumping to get their wings that day. So there are a lot of parents there because it's summertime. So the parents oh. are there watching their kids. They <laughs> see this <laughs> coming down. Oh, that's, not your, that's not your son. That's not your daughter. Don't worry. That's one of our talented instructors. He knows what yeah. he's doing. That's a, that's a demo. So, but I go down, I land down the ravine by the, 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 the creek that's running through the academy. I go down there. So they, all they see is this thing going down. They don't see the impact and the, me laying there. So in the, in the, in just like any Mako brief, you know, if you're hurt, stay down, wave your hand, we'll get, get you some help. If you're not, stand up, let us know you're okay. So I'm laying there and I'm trying to get my wind about me. I'm wiggling my toes a little bit. And I kind of roll my ankles. And I kind of, and I'm like, <laughs> I think I'm fine. And I'm like, holy crap, I'm alive. So I'm like, screw this. I stand up. I'm standing up. And I got lines coming off me. I know I'm basically a crime scene. I don't want to mess with anything before yeah. my Swift 2 gets there or something like that. And then Colonel Pescio comes up over the ridge line. He goes, holy. He's, he's looking down. He goes, oh, shit. I thought you were dead. I was like, so did I. He goes, you okay? I was like, oh my god, I can't believe it. He's a, you okay? I was like, I think so. I think I'm all right. I was like, hurt kind of bad, but I'm all right. And then a fire truck comes across the flight line, across the fields from the tow plane area on the academy, 
airfield and this big fire chief civilian guy gets out he's got clipboard and he's got the guys coming around the corner with a backboard and a neck brace i'm like oh here we go i've been on those, one of those before and he goes hey man you need to lay down you're gonna be you're in shock you don't know how bad you're hurt i was like i don't need help right now thank you you can go away cop car pulls up because he's driving by he sees and so he's got lights going the guy's like you're not gonna you're gonna you're refusing medical treatment i'm like yes i'm refusing medical treatment go away he goes, you have to sign this release that releases me of any liability i signed it chuck norris and I, of course i was joking but i signed it chuck norris and he he left so we get back in we, we load up in this one of the vehicles, the Swift Two vehicle, we go back to where everybody loads up, and there's parents there, students are there, people like looking, waiting to see what is left of the corpse that just hit the ground. And I step out. All right, for my next trick, I'm going to jump without a parachute. Y'all gonna love it. <laughs> the commander's like, "That's it's not funny." And I'm like, "Well, come on, dude. Everybody's it is funny. <laughs> I, I'm okay, so we can now yeah. laugh." Right, exactly. Right, right. You know, and the guy and he's like, "No, not cool." So I'm inside and filling, I'm filling, out, I'm filling out the safety paperwork because you know it's an accident and it's got to be yeah. documented. And that's about the time the drone started wearing off, and I felt really crunchy inside. My neck yeah. felt really crunchy. My back didn't feel too hot. And I said, "I think I need a drama. I, I'm gonna go to the hospital." And it was day one that my wife was meeting all the hospital staff and the hospital commander and stuff. And so I called her, Hey babe, I had kind of a tough landing on the airfield. I'm going to go to the ER just to let you know, not to get freaked out. She goes, okay, I'm meeting the commander in a few minutes. I'll come down when I can. I said, all right, cool. So I get in the vehicle and they say, Hey, so captain so-and-so, he was an A-10 pilot, drive him to the hospital. So he gets in the vehicle. He goes, Hey, they want me to drive. I said, no, you're not driving. I said, <laughs> Romad will drive. You're the A-10 <laughs> pilot, I'll drive. So I drive up there, walk into the ER, and I said, hey, uh, had kind of a tough landing to the airfield. She said, you're the guy that refused medical treatment. I was like, yep. They said, how do you feel? I said, I don't feel so good. Like, All right, we'll get you back to x-rays as soon as we it comes open. Just have a seat. We'll be right there. And then all the hospital staff and my wife come down. Oh, this is the, the famous. It's Lee Blackwell, the guy that you know doesn't know how to skydive, <laughs> land the parachute, whatever. <laughs> so I meet all them, and they take me back and they give me an X-ray, and I'm waiting in the waiting room. They come back and they said, "You have not broken a thing. You've basically just bruised your frame." I'm like, "Wow, really?" She goes, "Here's a couple of Percocet." I'm like, oh, "I've had those before," <laughs> and. uh I've had them when I crushed my feet. I had them, took them so often that they weren't working very well. So I found out also as an instructor at the schoolhouse that Coors Light in Percocet works really, really good. <laughs> and then I realized, okay, I can understand why there are people that are addicted to drugs, man. This is crazy. This yeah. is, I had, I had to stop. I needed to feel when I was hurting myself and doing too much because sure. I was yeah. so medicated you know, and, and and we go to these deployments, and, and guys were going to deployments well after all the deployments I went on, and they go to these, I don't know what they call them. It's almost like they go to this place to decompress and kind of talk about their deployments. You know, we didn't we didn't have any of that. No one talked to us. You know, I I, I talked to a mental health person at, at Pope once, and uh, I've had some dark thoughts. I've worried about myself a lot. But, you know, it does, doesn't, that kind of stuff just doesn't happen in combat only. It happens in life every day. You know, we lose people to the silliest things in the world. We lose people that have random, you know, health issues. You know, we're all dealing with tough stuff. So, right. you know, I, I, it's not just about Lee. It's not just about, you know, how's Lee doing? And we're all struggling, man. We're all struggling. Yeah. We're all doing the best we can. And um, that's one thing I try to kind of try to re remind myself. It's okay if you have a bad day, dude. You know? Sure. You're not right. going to be at 100%. It's okay. Give yourself yeah. a break. You know?
I retired out of there, and uh, I, the day after I pushed the button, Sean Minion called me. He goes, guess who's coming to Fort Carson in so-and-so in you know, three months? Or, I'm like, oh, he goes, you. You're going to be one of my NCICs. I'm like, what are you talking about? I just hit the retire button. He goes, no. And uh, <laughs> I wish I I wish I would have stayed in because I always wanted to wear my dad's chief stripes, the old chief stripes. For a day, you know, yeah. do that for my dad. But I chose to put my family first, and I think that was the right decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I was mentally not stable, especially to. I, I was I was going through some dark stuff. I think it cost me my marriage. I think both of us weren't doing our part, you know, and uh, we we're both having a tough time trying to to be in that relationship and. Thankfully, she's in a good relationship now, and I'm in a good relationship now. We're cordial. We can be parents to our kids, and and um, and, I, and I'm I'm very thankful for that. So, yeah, I good. I I was able to retire out of the academy. I struggled to find a job, man. I really did. Worked at Sonic for a short time. Yeah, I read that. In your bio. Dude, that was that was crazy. I remember one night, this girl. I'm sitting there. And I'm just trying to learn. The TV, the TV is the life of the cook, right? Because in, in Sonic, when someone when you place your order, a timer starts, and as long as it's under three or four minutes, I think is what it was four minutes, it stays green. But once it goes over three minutes, it goes to amber. Then it goes over four minutes, it goes to red. Well, the more orders you get out on green, the managers, not the cook, not the minimum wage people, they make more money. They make. It's better for their reports. They they do better. Yeah. For me, I just try to learn this TV. Well, I had this girl. She's 21 years old. She's a night shift supervisor. She starts cussing at me. You need to hurry up with those fucking hamburgers. <laughs> All right. I'm going to let you cuss me a couple more times. I'm going to punch you in the face. <laughs> yeah. So, and I'm, I'm slow. It's just, it's, I don't know what I'm doing. I've been there a week. I'm trying to figure it out. My mindset was, if I can get JD, what he ordered and cooked all the way, he may come back. Right. That was my mindset. She's just get him out, get him out, get him out, get him out. About third or fourth time, she starts cussing me. I just turned to her. I said, you need to shut your mouth. And the young kid that was helping me learn how to cook, Chris, he's non-confrontational. He just starts walking away. I said, Chris, get back here. You're, you're cooking chicken, brother. I see you're doing a great job. I see Christy, she was working the, the window and all the stalls. She is a little high school girl. She's crushing. I said, Christy, you do your thing. You should be employee of the month. I said, yeah. I'm going to focus on dressing these burgers. And this girl keeps trying to talk to me. I said, you need to shut your mouth. And I said, okay, now, everybody good? I said, and, it, and I said, for you, you're going to get on the corn dogs, the tater tots, and the french fries. She goes, you know, I said, shut your mouth. Get on the tater tots, the French fries, and the corn dogs, and I started running the shift. The next morning, I got called. I said, "Oh hell, I'm gonna get fired." Yeah. She goes, "Hey, Lee, you want to come in and talk to you?" I was like, "Sure, sure, sure, sure." So I got there. She's like, "Hey, we have the lunch rush. Can you help us get through the lunch rush?" Then I'll then we'll talk. I'm like, "Sure." So we got through the lunch rush. She pulls me aside. She goes, "You know why I called you?" I says, "Yeah, you're gonna fire me." She goes, "Why would I fire you? I want to offer you a manager job." I was like. Why would you offer me a manager job? She goes, because you're an older guy. You're, you have really good work ethic. You're, you're, you think about the foods and the products and the, what we have on stock and when we need to order. I said, you, she, you think about that kind of stuff. I said, I thought you were going to fire me. She goes, why would I fire you? I said, what happened last night? So I told her what happened. She goes, oh, my gosh. We've had a tough time with her. We're, we're thinking about letting her go. I said, how about we don't let her go? How about we just help her? Yeah. Give her someone else that can help her be really, really good. I said, she goes, well, we want you to, you, you know, be a manager and you probably can have your own store and run, you know, own a couple Sonics. I was like, I appreciate that, but I don't have any interest in climbing the corporate Sonic ladder. All I right. said, but I'll do my three months. Like I told you, once my retirement starts, I'm out of here. I said, this is a young person's job. And I, yeah. I bailed. End up going through See, medical. But that, that right there illustrates, like you know, I don't want to get off on a tangent here, but that we talk about transition and on this podcast a lot, and you know, guys getting out and and 
that right there, that kind of attitude, that kind of uh, drive and where you are and what you've done as, in the military as a tech P it just translates perfectly over to like managing people and like directing yeah. people and seeing and finding solutions to problems that these kids or anybody, frankly, wouldn't see. And yeah, that just, I, that didn't surprise me a bit. <laughs> you know, I, in, in what the military didn't teach me is how my stuff correlates and translates. Sure. I didn't, right. know, I didn't know that I am marketable in corporate America or in, you know, to start my own uh, business. I didn't, I, I did not, was not trained to think like that. And right. uh, it's crazy how much it does translate and correlate to the civilian life. It does, you yeah. know, and I, and I think, it, you know, it goes back, you, you got to care about your job. We've all had people, whether it's been supervisors, whether it's been bosses and teachers, you can tell when they're there just giving you what they, they got to give you. But you also can tell those people that when they speak and you get, you get excited and you start getting, uh, I'm on board. You know, you want to be around people like that. Sure. You know, I don't. I don't want to be around people that are just, they're just giving me what they got to give me, and, and I'm out. You know. Yeah. And if that's what you are in your life, that's cool. I'm. I'm happy for you. Sure. Sure. But, you know. So, I, I. It took me a while to find the job. I, I got the job as a medical assistant, and I had done my 180 hours of. They call it extern instead of intern. They call it externship, where you're outside the school doing. 180 hours of work in a clinic or at a hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had done my 180 hours and that research clinic offered me a job and I took it. And I was just making a minimum wage. I was just, you know, doing um, vitals on people, drawing blood, doing EKGs, just doing basic medical assistant type job. And mm -hmm. uh, it was a Wednesday and Alex Miller calls me on the phone and I'm in my house. My ex and I were just button heads, man, just, yeah, not being nice to each other at all, and um, he said, like, "Hey, man, I got an opportunity for you to make crazy good money." I said, "Well, I'm interested in that because I retired in 2008 when the economy tanked and I couldn't find a job, yeah. dude. It sucked." And uh, so it was teaching, it was working for Aero Environment, but I had to um, be in California on Sunday, and I was like, "It's Wednesday." I said, "What about two weeks' notice?" He goes, "Lee, how much money are you making now?" I said, "Seven fifty." He goes, you want to make seven fifty an hour for the rest of your life, or do you want to make hundred fifty thousand in in six months? I'm like, well, yeah, sure. Yeah, Going back, put it that way, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I went back the next day to the clinic and I talked to my boss. His his uh, rep, Mr. Ramos, was his name, and I said, hey, I've got an opportunity to take care of my family and do a contract job downrange, making pretty good money. And uh, he goes, really. He goes, you got any other openings? I was like, no. <laughs> and then he says, well, let's go talk, tell the boss. I said, oh, I don't want to tell her that this is a girl that owned the research clinic, this woman, okay. and, uh, or ran it. And uh, I told her, I said, hey, this is the situation. She goes, Lee, we like what you're doing. We like your work ethic. If things don't work out when you deploy as a civilian, please come back. We'll give you your job back. Don't even, nice. without even without even asking, I was like, "Oh my gosh, seriously?" She goes, "Yes," and I was able to get into the contracting world, and I did. Um, it wasn't the Raven Puma. We were doing, we were learning the Silver Fox. I think eventually it became a Silver Fang. It was a gas operated rail launched belly landing uh, EOIR camera is what it had on it, mm -hmm. and it wasn't part of the inventory, um, but it was. It was in R and D trying to get accepted in the in into the um, military or the DOD. But anyway, yeah. so our job was to basically fly this in support of route clearance patrol uh, units driving out of Salerno to and from the other fobs. Oh, okay. And we had this engineer captain. Oh my gosh, this guy was a complete waste of air. He was a CCT washout. He would always walk around with his sleeves tucked, you know, cropped right above his wrists like the operators do. And he would wear ranger panties when he did his PT. He never wore, took his weapon anywhere. He'd always leave it hanging, un unlocked in his room. He had, was, would randomly pick spots along a, a MSR for us to go and look at. And I'm like, well, why don't we go down to the battalion? find out what the objective is, find out 
when and where they had, you know, NAIs or EOD, uh, um, IEDs go off and stuff and start l helping them looking at patterns of life. We can be doing that days before they even go out. Well, we don't want to mess with, you know, what, what, what they're doing. I was just like, so I got to a point where I was like, look, I'm not doing what you're doing. He would come and give us mission brace. I wouldn't be there. I'd be in the talk, talking to the army. I started bringing the guys that would dismount on um, the convoys. I'd bring them in the tower with us to, to watch the camera and bring their radios Smart. and they could be able to talk to them. And uh, multiple times, at one point we had, we found out that what they were doing during the summer when there wasn't a lot of rain, they were flooding the roads. They were flooding the crops to flood the road to then bury the IED in the mud when the radar uh, spatula car trucks came up, the water would mess up the signal so they couldn't tell whether there's an ID there or not. Oh, okay. And we found we found guys sitting on command command wires clicks away from the road. And then we found the wire all the way to and we'd stop convoys. We we got really, really good at what we were doing. Nice. And uh, it was a is it, it was a really, really cool six months. Up until the point when we got breached, Salerno got breached their second time. Um, they blew the front gate. They cut the wires near where the C-130s turn around on Salerno. They were lobbing um, RPGs and uh, 107s at the fuel point for the FARP. They were trying to shoot that. And um, here, here I am as a contractor. I have to stay in my, my building because I don't have a weapon. I'm not gunned up. I'm not that yeah, yeah. cool of a contractor to have a weapon. You know, I have to rely on a Joe to take care of me. And every time it happened, they did a great job. You know, we had Rangers on the on the FOB, and those guys didn't get very far, you know, after they – that was the second time I think they breached, I think. Yeah. But we had AC-130 on station. I've got um, – I was able to see back then the video from the rate cameras – uh, the p tids cameras and stuff, uh, aerostats mm -hmm. from the FOB and the firefight, pretty wild. Then I got, because I got into that, when I came back from that, um, one of the things we did that I was very proud of, that I basically got with the guys that did Switchblade, you know, the drone, the Switchblade. Yeah. They have a certain battery life. Their stuff won't work unless the, the, the drone takes off. If it's taken off, it's got to go terminal at some point. Mm -hmm. It only has, it says it has a 30 minute battery, but realistically it's 15 to 20 minutes. Really, you have a hot, sweet spot. And I said, I said, why don't we fly our Silver Fox over some known NAIs, poo sites, um, and kind of be airborne? Uh, and when we see poo sites start to get active, we can then have you launch. And be more uh, accurate that so you're going to hit somebody because someone's going to be there, and that's what we did. We ended up putting our RSC, our controller, at a different fob, launched our switchblade, did a handoff. Our our other civilian guy was at that fob, controlled our plane while the switchblade guy watched, and then launched and went kinetic on some people with it. But nice. When I got back. I did an interview with Aero Environment, the guys that eventually become Rally Point. We were teaching Raven and Pumas, and I was in the interview for that, and I told them that story, and they said, like, well, what? what? You what? And uh, <laughs> basically, they were just excited. I was critically thinking about, hey, you know, what outside the box potentials can we sure. use? And um, so that helped me get hired on Rally Point. Rally Point was a really good gig. I, I enjoyed that quite a bit. Really good people to work with kind of ended kind of bad kind of just started getting rid of us left and right and yeah. um then i was able to pick up a my last contract job working with um it's called strategic integration um eric brandenburg was the president of the company yeah i remember that i remember when he was in doing that yeah so we had a laser designator on the mx 25 cameras the big p tids the two camera p tids and my job was to try to get the guys in the top to be trained enough in case the JTAC needed 
a laser shot from the P tids, they could do, they could do it. Oh. And they were never able to do it, but that was my last contract job. And then I would, we got picked up in 2015 at Nellis as an instructor and loved it. But that was that was crazy, man, to learn. Okay, type one, two, three, BOC, BOT. There's there's sims now. There was I walked into a dome. I was like, what are you are you kidding me? <laughs> right. There's there's no way. Um, I, it was it was amazing. And then oh, because the you were J saying you had to go through like you you'd been so long out of the JTAC game that you had to yeah. redo the whole course and get taught everything. And, and yep. like you were just saying, there's so much more that they've added on since you were doing it. That yeah, it was probably the way they eye opening. Cast, I'm sure. Yeah, the way they do cast now, even now, when I, I left in what 2022, 2021, the FTU, um, they're doing cast different. You know, they're teaching different. And uh, and that's just a testament to the the craft. It's it's evolves. It's evolving to whatever theater you know we're in. Right. We can put cast in effect. But um, that was very humbling to go through that course, and I was able to get through it no problem. Um, and start controlling, start teaching. I liked to teach. And uh, around 2016, that's when the FTU 2015, 2016-ish, when they started talking about the FTU. 2017, I got involved late 2016, and uh, and uh, my daughter had the first grandchild. I saw an opportunity to go out to Camp Bullis and help them stand that course up, and kind of relocate my position. And they, the six CTS, let me do that until a couple of years ago, and I was very, very fortunate. I, I yeah. wanted, I want our pipeline to be a true pipeline. I want it to be done right. It's not where it needs to be. It's going to evolve, as we all know it. You know, if Bragg was in charge of the FTU, it would be run one way. If Drum was, Carson, right. we all got our way, and not one of them was wrong. Not one of them was wrong. And I think that's why I like the schoolhouse because you get so many different people coming in. Sure. Know. When I started going, but wasn't, to that, wasn't that the whole point? Was that the like guys were getting trained? They were getting, like you said, it, it's good training, but it was different. So there was there was so much non standardization throughout the career oh, yeah. field. Like you guys were integral and in like make like look, all right, we're gonna make these guys from cradle to grave until they get their five level or wasn't it five level they were gonna get or yes. I can't remember exactly what it was. Yeah. yeah. So every TAC P guy is gonna be have, know the same stuff, kind of like the CCT guys do or the PJs or yep. whoever. 100%. They all knew the same stuff, and uh, you know, so when you get to your unit everybody's kind of talking the same language. Whereas yes. when we were going through, it was like, well, who was your, who were your instructors at the time? Yeah. And, okay. Then you went to this unit and they, you know, like you just said, Bragg does something different than Polk and does something different than hood. And 100%. it was all just kind of haphazard, but yeah, I, I love what they're doing now. I love what you guys I, have I, done with that. I think what the key to all of this is, I think they're trying to put a lot of ways, the cart before the horse. I think what they need to address is the CFETP. I think they yeah. need to make sure that the schoolhouse is graduating true three levels, true yeah. three levels, owning the, the three level items that they can't teach to pass them off to the FTU. So then they have to get them to a three and a five or get them to a true five. Mm -hmm. But then the, then the units have to get them to that seven and nine. But, you know, I, I, I think that once we can get what the standards are, because they're, supposedly there's still a, a CFTP out there that's not dropped that is is waiting to drop, you know. Okay. You know? And uh, that affects three level, that affects five level, and that affects the ASOSs because you have a different MER requirement, minimum instructor requirement. Mm -hmm. My job being curriculum developer for the FTU and the CTS was to ensure people were doing the standards, teaching to a th to th make sure they're true three C or five A or whatever whatever skill level they're required to teach them at. My job was to ensure they taught them and they yeah. teach them the standards, the right instructor mer, the right ratio, the right skill level, the right equipment. You have to have everybody has to be able to touch that equipment the right amount of times. It's right. about repetition it's about proficiency and that's where it's we still need to, to to get better at it you know yeah um it's it belongs to the six but it's at camp bullis you know the guys do you foresee that uh, 
like getting better? Do you foresee that it improving or is it kind of, are we stagnating or what, how do you feel about it? I think we are definitely improving, especially with the, with the guys we have down there, um, oh, great. both the leadership and the instructors. Uh, they are teaching new curriculum since I've left and they're doing a great job. They're doing a really, really good job. I think that what we need is we need to be able to give three level. We need to give five level everything they truly need, Mm -hmm. whether it's facilities, whether it's equipment, whether it's the amount of structures, you know, and we we need to do right by the students. Sure. That's the end product. That's what we're, that's what we're, we're creating and making at the end of the day in our, in our tech factory. And if we're not making them right, we need to fix it. Yeah. I've talked to a lot of guys on here and, and I talked to some guys in the career field. Um, they say that it's working. I mean, it, it, the guys that are, the guys we're putting out now, like when you went through, when I went through, you know, it was kind of hit and miss of the skill level or the intensity or, you know, just the professionalism. But now it just seems like every, it, like you, it's almost like a factory. Like you're just making these awesome in shape squared away tech P dudes and it's yeah. super cool. So wherever unit they go to, you're getting a bunch of badasses, essentially. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's kind of cool. I definitely have my opinions on how they could do things better, but that's just normal tact p isms, kind of. You know, sure. sure. I, I I teach them my way. I, I would. I would teach them. Uh, I would. I would have certain people that I know that are good at certain things teach certain things. I mean, I would. I would stack right. the deck. You know, for then sure. Again, yeah, it makes then, sense. But then again, you're taking away from the career field. You're taking away from people's opportunity to make rank. You know, yeah, that's the one thing I wish I could have done better as an NCO. I wish I could have taken better care of my guys. I wish I could have, someone have taught me to to write better. Yeah, build build a package, play the game, give my guys a shot to to make rank ahead of everybody else. Oh um, yeah, that's one thing they they never did right by me. The career field, big Air Force. Oh yeah, you know. For sure. There's some really, really, and we all know it, really intelligent, really, really smart, really phenomenal men in this career field. I mean, oh, for sure. Standing men. Without a doubt. And, um, but I think it's just, I, I, I don't think it's, um, any malice. I think it's just ignorance. I think, I, cause I oh, mean, yeah. uh, you, it, you, you come by this information by chance. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I, like I didn't even understand kind of the prerequisites to make chief until I went to AFSOC headquarters and I was exposed to CCT chiefs like chief Dixon was instrumental. I'm like, I'm like, so what do I do? Like, what do you, what do you guys do to prepare your guys to make chief? And he's like, Oh, you don't have this. And he like, give me a piece of paper that had like a bunch of stuff on it that he, we should, I'm like, I've never seen this before in my life. So right. it's, and like I said, it's not, I don't think anybody was trying to keep that from us. I just think you don't get exposed to it. I mean, we're on army posts and we're not really exposed yeah. to like air force culture. So yeah, it was very challenging for guys like it. I think it's better now, a heck of a lot better now, but yeah, back in the day, it was just kind of like a crapshoot if you got that info or not. I've heard to make rank and stuff. There's, there's, it's all different now. Yeah. I, I couldn't even tell you what it is now. Yeah. I, could. Uh, I get lost in the sauce when I start talking about rank and, you know, EPRs or whatever. Yeah. So. The, yeah. The reports are all different and yeah. I think it's better. I, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I, I think I think it is a better system. Um, but yeah, I couldn't tell you what it is. I just wanted I wanted guys to have the best opportunity to get the best kind of training. Sure. And and I need needed guys to have a lot of want to initiative and not be the kind of guys to sit and wait to be told. I didn't, didn't right. want to be around, didn't want to be around that guy. So. Yeah, um, it was it, it went by really really fast, brother. It went by really really fast. I do miss it. I wish, um, yeah. It's not that I wish. I miss it. I miss it. I miss the camaraderie. I miss the guys. Um, but it's about my wife and I. I'm in a different part of my life, and it, it's it's a good part of my life. I'm happy. I'm, I'm doing amazing things, and. Uh, seeing great places and living a good life. So very thankful. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what it's all about. I mean, we do what we can while we're in. And then once we get out, we have to just accept that we're out and focus on other stuff, you know, especially our spouses and our family. You know, we, I've talked about this a lot. A lot of guys have talked about this, but you, they put up with us essentially for all that time. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. now it's kind of like, now we're out. Now it's their time to, 
to shine and you know it's, it's our time to support them and take care of them and kind of be there for them so i think you're doing the right thing i think i, I feel the same way i wasn't ready to get out when i got out but you know you I'm not going to dwell on it. You know, I'm not going to cry about it. It's, it is what it is. And then what happened was what happened. And you can yeah. only focus on the things you could control. And yeah. I struggled last few years at FTU because I didn't feel like I was relevant. I didn't feel like that I had a, enough to provide to the students that my stuff was so old that didn't, it, was, it wasn't relevant. Uh, so yeah. what I try to, to focus on my last few years is like, look, I need you all to be good at your craft. I need you to focus on being as good as you can. Um, let's say we have all this nice, all this nice Gucci gear. You have all this cool stuff and everything is attached to you. And you get in this big, beautiful vehicle, this brand new vehicle that they have, this JLTV. And you close the door and you close your door on a cable that's attached to your gear. I said, then what are you going to do? They're like, well, uh, I said, no, dudes are shooting at you right now. What are you going to do? You know? Then they'll start grabbing the radio and take the radio, throw it off the side. Your radio's a shot, dude. What are you going to do? Think. <laughs> you know? I, I need you to care very much about being very, very good. You want to right. be the best you can. You know? So, I, I've, I've loved my career field. I care about my career field. I still want to be connected in some way and and be relevant but you know life happens man we get older uh life happens man so yeah do the best we can so that's all you can do uh, yeah and uh, where, where are you at right now uh upstate new york i'm probably oh, okay three miles from the canadian border oh wow okay literally that is that close. because of your wife or did you meet her and then you guys moved there or were you already there? Well, so I, when I went through becoming a medical assistant in 2009, she's the one that actually enrolled me in the school. She, oh, okay. was married, she was married. I was married. Nothing ever happened. I didn't do anything shady, anything like that. I just yeah. felt a connection with her. And sure. I worked at the school for a little bit while I was a student. And um, so I got to be at the school more than normal. So we knew each other and then stayed connected when I got the contract job. And years later, after I got divorced, I was on my last contract job and I just reached out just to say, Hey, and see how she was doing. And she was going through a divorce and, uh, we just reconnected and, uh, I got back from my deployment in 2014. We reconnected, started dating a little bit. She followed me out to Vegas. And then years later, I, we got married. And um, so her her boys live in New York City. Okay. And they grew up in San Antonio area, high school time frame of their life. So that's where she still lived. And then she moved to Louisville, Kentucky. And then we reconnected in 2014. So we got married in 2017. And um, she's always gone where I've the job was whether it's Nellis, whether it's Camp Bullis, and I chose to go to Camp Bullis because my daughter lived in New Braunfels. Because I retired, I lived in San Antonio. My daughter went to school in San Marcos, and then lived, you know, got married and lived in lives in New Braunfels now. So I took advantage of going to Texas. So I, when I retired from the FTU, I was like, "Where do you want to go?" So <laughs> she has her family's from kind of the. It's north of Toronto, about three hours north. It's called it's cottage country called Bob Cajuns, where she grew, born and raised and grew up. And um, okay. they have like fifty something acres up there, family. And she took me to the Thousand Island area, um, kind of near Kingston and um, Rochester, kind of that area oh, yeah, okay. of the of the the border of Canada and New York. Just topographically, it's just beautiful. It's just gorgeous. And the summers are amazing. They're not 120 degrees like in Texas. Right. Um, the winters are dark. And they're short. You get a lot of snow up there. Yeah, you get a lot of snow. But where we're at here, it's, it's almost kind of like the, the lake effect doesn't hit us that, that much. This is oh, our nice. first winter. We have no snow on the ground right now. We're probably going to get some snow next week, and it's going to be gone in 
couple of days after that. So oh, we'll probably have a couple of days of, you know, minus 20, minus 30. But short, dark days, that's, you know, yeah. wife doesn't like that. Be closer to her family because they're older sure. and not doing well. And now we get to be closer to her her sons and our grandson. So took advantage of that. And we got yeah. 15 acres. We have an orchard. We have about nice. 130 different nut fruit berries and stuff growing on our property. So it's awesome. Yeah. So we're trying you got, to, how, is there any trouble getting across the border? You guys just go back and forth kind of, I mean, you got your passport, I reckon, but our closest but, Starbucks, yeah, but our closest Starbucks is five miles away in Cornwall. I go across the border <laughs> to go to Starbucks for my wife. Nice. And I'm sure if you're going with her, that the, I'm sure the border guards don't give you any grief the, with her no. being, does she still, is she still a Canadian citizen or? She's Canadian. She has a green card to work in the States. So she has to okay. show a green, a green card in her passport and I show my passport. So they're probably yeah. like, yeah, just get on in here. They give the military guys a hard time coming right. through the border because you yeah. know what I mean? Cause they're like, do you have, cause it's all about guns. They think we all have like tons of guns in our car and we're like, no, we're following the rules. We don't have any guns. You know, they're like, no, you have guns and they make you park and it's just a hassle. But yeah, you guys probably have an easy way getting across. Yeah. I, I, when I, one of the times that, uh, recently I went across the border I got stopped and they made me go inside and I was just like, dude, there's nothing in my car. Why are you guys pulling me over? And the guy's like, well, you're, you say you're a veteran and we typically find that the veterans are the ones who are going to forget. They have a pistol in the, in the glove box yeah. or, you know, right. Know. Right. I was like, well, my experience is they're going to be the most disciplined ones. That's exactly the guys that right. I know that have, so. Yeah. We should have the best reputation, not the worst reputation, you know? That's yeah. Kind of you know, I, I, I gun control is a, is a, is a hot topic for a lot of people. And yeah. I will say, I uh, probably shouldn't say this at all, but you know, I have PTSD. Yeah. I should be, I should, and I don't have a problem. If someone wants to examine me and test me and determine whether or not I'm capable of owning a firearm and being safe, I'll, 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 I'll follow the rules hundred percent. Not yeah. a problem at all, you know, but I also have to be prepared to that day. They say, Hey, you're a little too bad crazy to have a gun, dude. Yeah. It's like, yeah. who are you to decide? Yeah. That's what I'm getting at. You so. know what I mean? You know, like who are they to say that, Oh, Lee can't have one now. It's like, well, that, you just oh, wait, based on your made up psychological criteria that, you know, that yeah. guys like you validated. I mean, it doesn't make, I don't know. That seems hokey. Yeah. All that psychology. But, stuff. So wait, but, so go, going back to the, your PTS, what have you done anything about it? Or have you, have you, do you, do you have any techniques that you use to, you know, well, overcome it or honestly for me, I, I've never, I've never been medicated. I've never tried to do any antidepressants. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Um, I, um, I tell my story anytime I get an opportunity, I'll, t- I'll, I'll talk. I have to tell, I have to talk about Ray and the reason my mindset is if I talk about Ray, Ray is still present. He is still alive. His memory is still here. So I jump at a chance to talk about Ray whenever I can. It's almost kind of weird to some people, I'm sure, but that's where I'm coming from. If I get to talk about Ray, we'll, we can at least say he's still with us. That's why I talk about him. That's my biggest therapeutic thing I do. Is I if I get the opportunity to help someone and kind of spin it in a way to hey look dude your job is important your boss your supervisor your chief your commander needs you to bring your A game because it directly helps the mission the overall mission not just your mission so I just try to spin it that way so I get I, I like talking about Ray but I'll be honest with you I don't know how how supportive some people are about this or not but I found. I tried cannabis in 2014. I came back for the first time from my last deployment. I, I tried cannabis. Never smoked it in my life, ever. And the reason why I bring this up is, to me, it's very important. Is uh, I had I was with a TACP friend, brother, and it was very in a very controlled environment, and it couldn't have gone better. He asked me if I had smoked before. I said nope. I had no clue. It was very comical. He broke out the pipe. He started getting things ready. He he did his thing and he handed me a pipe and I literally said, "Do I wipe it? Do I do I do a little? How, how do I?" He starts laughing at me. He's like, "You've never done this." I was like, "Dude, someone could have been smoking a joint next to me. I would have known it. I would have thought it would be right, right. 
I just didn't grow up like that. I was the yeah. good kid. I, I played by the rules. I did. And so I, I started smoking. And he asked about what happened to Ray because he didn't, he's never heard the story. So I started relaying the story. And it got, it got to a point where all of a sudden doors started opening up in my mind. I was able to remember things that I hadn't remembered for 15 years. And Probably suppressing it, you know, just unconsciously suppressing those memories. and It was powerful. Yeah. It, I remembered the dog. That's why I'm excited to talk about the dog because, like, I remember that dog for 11 years, probably. I remember the dog. I remember having sitting in the room talking with Ray about his kids, his daughter, and his uh, new daughter on the way. I remember having a big banquet like meal. They, they killed a goat, and it was the most disgusting barbecue. Now we're going to have a big barbecue. <laughs> They're going to kill a goat. It's going to be great. It was, it was all fatty, nasty. It was just like, I'm going to yeah. have the shits for a couple of days. Great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, it, it allowed me to remember a lot about that, that time, not just that day. Yeah. And at one point, my friend tells me, says, Lee, stay in the light. And I'm like, what? He goes, don't go where the story is going to take you, where it's going to end. Don't go there. He goes, stay right here where you're at in the sweet spot. He's crying. I'm crying. At one point, I'm like, I look to my left or to the right, and everything after I look, everything eventually comes over to me and comes into focus. It was like, wait a second, something's not right. It's like the Percocet with the Coors Light. Whoa, yeah, yeah. moly. And I, I, and I realized I was t talking a lot, a, a lot. And I said, I think, I'm, I think I'm high. I think I'm high. I look over, and he's crying. He goes, it's a beautiful man. I was like, am I high? He goes, yeah, you're high. I'm high. Yeah, you're high. Yeah, I am high. <laughs> and it, but that was my experience. It was yeah. co completely therapeutic. And it, it allowed my mind to kind of just, just settle down for a second. Yeah. There wasn't any noise. There wasn't any stress. There wasn't any tension. There wasn't an elephant sitting on my chest or my shoulders. There wasn't. And I will say that. Now I partake on a regular basis. I mean, there, and, uh, there's something great. you said about like the, like I don't predict, I don't myself, I don't, but I, I've, yeah, I've never understood, you know, a, a law that said you can't do this to yourself. Like you're, you can't ingest something in your, you know, we we say, well, you can drink as much alcohol as you want, you can, you know, chew tobacco, you can smoke cigarettes. Yeah. But this other thing over here, we don't want you to do it. For what, and then it, yeah, yeah. it stems back to politics. It doesn't have any real bearing on. And there's no real reason yeah. why not. Money, yeah, yeah. I'm sure, is a big thing. Yeah, hundred percent. I um, I don't understand the, those kind of laws. Where if I I'm taking this and all I really want to do is chill out, maybe have the munchies. Maybe <laughs> I don't have any desire to get in a car. I don't want to go anywhere. I am calm. I feel. I feel physically good. I don't have pain in my neck, my back, my knees, my feet. Oh, my God, I have ghost pains in my feet every now and then. It's Oh, that was 1998 I, I rolled that, that vehicle. Yeah. Those, pains, those pains are just turned off for a little bit. But mm -hmm. it's amazing, dude. So that's just – that is currently how I choose to – I try to deal with it, and I manage it. That's how I do it. So Yeah. Uh, no, I agree. I like I said. I mean, I think there's so many other avenues to deal with PTS and deal with pain management. Like not only what you, you know, I've talked to some other guys about psychedelics, and I mean that's essentially what you're doing is that yeah. those chemicals are having a reaction with the chemicals that are already in your brain, and you're mm. you're relaxing. You're like you said, you're opening up doors that have been closed, for, probably as a defense mechanism. You know, we don't want to think about 100%. these horrible things. But now you're 100%. you're doing it in a way you're opening these doors in a way that you can handle it and you can deal with it in a uh, without freaking out you know without mm -hmm. having a breakdown or something and I, I yeah. think it's I personally I think it's a lot safer than like you said you know taking a bunch of Percocet and drowning it in Coors Light I mean these this alcohol that we try to drown all these problems first of all alcohol is not that good for you anyway and yeah, yeah. it's that it's a depressant it's you know it's, it's like the worst thing you can do when you're already kind of depressed you know what i mean so i think people if they can find something like you have that helps them 
I, I yeah. say more power to you. 100%. I went to the roundup. They had this this last roundup, and you know, uh, Tommy Case is there, and they're talking about the the trips they'll they they fund to to get guys some treatment. I think that's right. amazing. We're yeah, trying awesome. to we're creating an LLC for to grow um, here, and yeah. um, I, my intent my my focus is trying to help veterans and people with PTSD, TBI, loss of limb, lo- you know, loss. Um, yeah, I want to help. Try to help people. Just try to help people in a in a right. controlled environment. Kind of much like what what I heard they're doing down in Mexico, just mm-hmm. something very controlled and safe for someone to get some help. That's right. that's what we're trying to do. So that's something that that we've tried to we're we're in the process of trying to figure out and, and, and start up. But that's currently my my focus. Well, keep me posted on that. I'll uh, when you get it up and running, you know, I'll post it on all my social media and make sure that yeah. people get the word out. And um, yeah, because yeah, I think it's important. I think you know, JT was doing a lot of stuff. Um, you know, there's some other guy, Brandon Temple is very is a very big advocate of uh, you know alternative PTS treatments. So yeah, uh, anything out there that for guys that whoever watched this or maybe have friends that or family that watch this and they they're struggling, I mean, that's that's in the end goal. You know, wh- how, whatever your views are on all this stuff. 100%. So at the bottom line, if we can if we can help a guy not put a gun in his mouth or not you know not sit in his house and drown his sorrows with, with alcohol or you know not talk to anybody, if we can get him out and doing stuff and feeling better, I mean that we've done something you know so yeah. that's and that's ultimately should be the goal. So I I have to do I I've, I've found over the years from all my years in the military and in the other experiences, I have a hard time trying to be happy and it's really yeah. easy for me to go dark for sure why, why is that why is it it's so weird i know to go dark it's the weirdest and... thing maybe it's natural for us to be you know we've we are our, our whole careers have been some sort of adversity that we've had to overcome you know whether it be you got to do a long road march like you were talking about or you got to go to combat or you're you know you, whatever it is it's all about overcoming this sucking you know we've it just sucks pretty much for 90 percent of the time in our careers it's it's just hard to do right. so we we it kind of gets natural for us to feel that way instead of just you know when we start feeling when we start sitting back and, and we're happy it's a weird feeling like wait a minute why should i be feeling this way should i i shouldn't be happy i should be sucking right now so right I can't, right it's, right it's hard yeah yeah i, I want to yeah. choose to live in the light why has it got to be so hard to work to get to there so right right we feel like we're kind of getting over or we're not doing what we should be doing if we're we're totally happy. It's weird. Right, it's right. a weird thing. Yeah. But uh, life, life is good. Life is. Uh, I'm very, very blessed. Um, and I'm, I'm, man, I'm just doing my best. I really am doing good. my best. Man, I'm glad to hear it. That's good. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, man. I pleasure's all mine. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on here. It was awesome. I really appreciate you being able to share and you know talking about this kind of stuff. It's really, I think it's not only helpful for you and me, but it's helpful for you know the career field. So I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's no problem at all, man. Hopefully, it's somewhat entertaining too, and y'all get a, a laugh. If it has to be at my expense, that's okay too. I don't mind. <laughs> right on. <laughs> all right, brother. All right, man. You need anything else for me? You let me know, okay, brother? I got you. All right, we'll do. Thank you. And yeah, like I said, keep me posted on that when you get that LLC up and running. We'll uh, yeah, we'll get it out there to the guys. I appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. All right, man.